Greetings and salutations to all you beautiful lovers out there. From the aces to the pollies and all those lovely people in between, welcome to Podsploitation celebration of the most artificially romantic time of the year, Valentine's Day. And what better way to commemorate this sexy, slinky and seductive Sunday than with a deep dive into syphilis, with a side serving of gonorrhea to boot. From the light-hearted and fancy-free mind that bought us BMX bandits and frog dreaming comes Brian Trenchard Smith's cautionary tale of the perils of the penile pleasures in the late 70s. They'll be dancing, they'll be romancing, there may even be the occasional lancing. So pull up a clean chair, grab a cup of your favorite fluid, and let's get the auditory three-way underway as we experience the laughter and tears of the love epidemic. Happy special edition Valentine's Day. Happy, Happy Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. Welcome back to Postploitation yeah. After Dark. Let's talk about syphilis and gonorrhea. Happy sexings. Yeah, this really did turn me off casual sex. <laughs> really? No, it's yeah. not just like all sex. So it worked. No. If you think about what they were maybe trying to do, then it worked. Yeah. So then the big question so is... I'm like 100% condoms every time. Oh, and yeah. this movie is like... still just, no. Yeah. You mean French letters? French letters? Why is it yeah. a letter? Because you put it in a slot, maybe? So that was one of the things okay. I intended to do some checking on and never got around to. There was a reason. They were called French letters and oh, there was another name for them as well. But, oh, God, yes. French tickler or something. No, no, no the French tickler is different. There's a little weird sea and enemy looking end. thing on the top. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so we're talking about 1975's The Love Epidemic. I'm November. I'm Callum. And I'm Daria. And we are technically looking at an educational film, but there's a whole bunch of sexy business going on because I suppose really it's a sex education or a safe sex education film. Yeah. So that's what I was going to say. Is this a tits and ass film that walks like a PSA or is this a PSA that walks like a tits and ass film? Well, there's quite the genre of things that label themselves sex education films that contains some minimal amount of information as excuse to show lots and lots of nudity and sex. And not just sex as well, because of course there's movies like Speed Freaks and Cocaine Freaks and what was the marijuana one? The marijuana films as well, where you say this will be the one that tells you about this thing that's incredibly important, just so that you can be incredibly controversial and shocking and... and Someone wrote a fabulous review on this, it's just a couple of sentences. It's kind of weird to do a Mondo sexploitation film around VD, but that's 1970s Australia for you. (laughs) Stuntman Grant Page summoning discharge out of his dick hole and discussing Hong Kong prostitutes is a bonus. <laughs> Very true. From what well res- said Fabio Testi. From what research I have done, this does Fabio. have a high actual education content in some of them. Yeah. I found a bunch where it's sort of like, and this is how you have sex well in this position, and you just show people having sex in this position. Oh, okay. They've barely got the veneer of education. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whereas I think by 1975 standards, the actual education content isn't bad. Yeah, agreed. Certainly there is a whole bunch of not even especially soft porn to string it together. Yeah. It was very much aimed at men, not at women. Mm. Yeah. So this wasn't commissioned. Nobody from New South Wales or Australian Health put out the call. The producers decided that they were just going to make a sex warning film, which would then give them an excuse to get a whole bunch of cocks on screen. And apologies to Brian Trenchard-Smith, who wrote, directed, produced everything to this film. He said, no one needs to see this movie. Yeah, which I And now we're going to talk about it in depth. He's putting down hard props on himself. I don't see this as some kind of terrible film that needed to be binned. No. No, at most you could say it's outdated, and of course that was going to happen to any movie. Oh god, yeah. Of course. And there is some stuff in here which does ring true today nonetheless. I love that there's someone who says pornography is freely available everywhere. It's like, oh, 1975, let me introduce you to 2021. Yeah. So we're talking about, you know, that kind of fine line of walking between, say, a PSA or a porn film or softcore porn. A couple of the actual actors in this tried to get an injunction on the film's release after appearing in it, saying that they were making pornography. But the credits are so unclear, we can't work out who's who. Mm. 
Callum thought they might be the couple that I, have sex at the start. I thought they might be the extended sex couple at the start because I can't imagine anybody else within the film. The most troubling scene of that to me was right before they have sex, everyone's clapping along to music, but he's like awkwardly holding her wrists and having her I clap. Did, I and did I notice that. I can't work out why she, or how. She was clapping in the very first sequence and then a little later on he he's making she needs her assistance. clap. Yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, when you like, when you're kind of you know hot on someone, you'll hold them in weird ways or whatever. It didn't look like she was fighting it. She just, oh no, no, yeah. she wasn't at she, all. Yeah, it, it wasn't. Was but it was weird. weird. I did notice yeah, it. Yeah, I figured they're yeah. just messing around doing weird things. And yeah, I know she almost said when you love someone, and I do think they were going out of their way to make look as casual as casual sex can be so, to shock the 1975 audiences. Uh, six minutes forty in this. So they've just shagged him. Did you have an orgasm? Her? Mm. Really? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> would you like a cigarette? Mm. Yeah, I would. Bro, she did not have that orgasm. Wow. Yeah, I was gonna. I recognise that grunt. And then they ask each other's names, which I thought was a really funny way of it. Yeah, well, that's the thing I was talking about before. That this is to shock the nice, clean 1975 people who think sex only happens between well-acquainted married couples. That mm. these two didn't even know each other's name. <laughs> Yeah. I'm trying to find any reference to the movies. There was a marijuana-based one and a cocaine one, which were meant to be... Are you still trying to remember the title of Reefer yeah, Madness? Yeah, yeah. They, they were... Reefer Madness. Why did you not just tell me? I was waiting Why for you to pause. Why did you not put me out of my... Put me out of my I was my waiting misery. for you to pause so I wasn't just slamming through you. Oh, no, please, feel free to slam through. I mean, you know, you you do a hell of a good job on editing these, but my brain is Swiss cheese. So, yes, so not just sex, but Reefer Madness and other movies like that. You see, one of the things was, there's a typewriter on screen reporting the number of syphilis and gonorrhea cases in the UK and Australia, but they're reporting them in raw numbers, whereas the yeah. stats I found for the near present were cases per 100,000. Okay. Oh, okay, right. So I had to pretend I knew how numbers work to work out what the <laughs> per 100,000 oh, was. Oh, so you had to find out the actual population at the time and then do the maths yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So how are we doing? So with the acknowledgement that some of these could be shaky and also because they would have been measured by different methods in decades apart. Mm. Okay. So yeah, you... so the gonorrhea in 1972 worked out to about 83.6 cases out of 100,000. Mm -hmm. In 2016, it was 100.8 out of 100,000. At least mm. the Australian numbers. Syphilis, 972, 9.2 out of 100,000. 2017, 18.3. Jesus. S stop. Just, I just always think of it as something that's been eliminated. Yeah. Use condoms, you... you, you Randy people. Randy people. <laughs> Be Randy. Fucking have fun. Enjoy. But use condoms. Jesus. Well, Jesus no, shouldn't. But anyway, yes. Well, use condoms. What well, the hell? Well, well you probably see? should. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, you'd want to set a good example. Well, Especially for like the second coming. So. Boom! Ah! Thank you, thank you. Actually, no, you're only meant to use them once. <laughs> uh, anywho... Tell them what's the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic. Okay, so this was one of the things, because we're currently recording this in the middle of a pandemic, and I vaguely remembered pandemics seeming to become a word when I was out of school, because always it was epidemic, epidemics and epidemics. An epidemic targets a specific group. So sometimes it'll be a particular country, a particular population. Sometimes it'll be a particular age group. But basically it's a measurable group. Mm -hmm. A pandemic is just group agnostic. So it's it basically worldwide. Anybody. It can affect anybody, anywhere. Different people may react to it differently. So you get certain groups that are particularly healthier that might be able to sort of shrug it off versus the ones that go down with it, as it were. Happy Valentine's Day. But <laughs> yeah, so that's the difference. And the words aren't interchangeable. Although calling this an epidemic, given that they're saying it can affect everybody. I mean, again and again, there's lines like this disease is a classless and these diseases yeah. can affect anybody. So probably even back then it was more accurate to call syphilis and gonorrhea pandemics rather than epidemics. Although, as you pointed out, it mostly would target those who are sexually active, even though there are ways of catching it through non-sexual activity. Yeah, and uh, I wonder if they had any statistics on how these infections are roaring through nursing homes, or at least pre-COVID, mm. they were. Well, I've got a general question just about this. How much genuine research do we think went into this, and how accurate do we think is a lot of the information? Because I tried looking up details of how much research did they do. Because it was really funny, one of the very first sequences where you've got the oh, guys in the bar. Oh, I have a question about the first sequence. And well, then the second sequence, the, the ones with the guys in the bar. Yeah. They let this guy go off for like five minutes, you know, spouting all sorts of nonsense and garbage. But this gonorrhea is different from uh, syphilis, isn't it? Ah, oh, they reckon it is. But nothing's been proved. I mean, VD's VD, isn't it? Yeah, well, I guess so. Are you circumcised? 
Oh, really? Oh, you're all right then. How's that? Well, if you've got a hem, you've got a better chance of picking it up. Yes, yeah, sir. And you just don't pick it up from screwing, you know. You can get it from kissing, too. Yeah. Some blokes even reckon you can get it from cricket balls. But then they don't actually target the individual things that he says. And um, then they yell because that everybody's so ignorant mm. after spouting all this disinformation. Yeah. So I don't know, for the time, would it have been a pretty accurate... Yeah, well, obviously those guys are supposed to represent the ignorance, the unawareness. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because it's not talked about, because people shy away from the top, because those <laughs> kind of boils down to those things, really. Yeah. And, I mean, we're not talking something as blatantly manufactured as Australia After Dark, so it's not that level, but, yeah. Well, okay, I imagine so they we'll... did research. There is one disputable fact later on, but we'll get to that, about uh, John Hunter. Ah, yes. Well, actually, there were a couple of things that came out. I noticed the John Hunter one that only relatively recently, also the 1492 one about the fact that gonorrhea wasn't in Europe prior to, uh, gonorrhea or syphilis, one of them wasn't in Europe prior to 1492 which suggests that it was actually Columbus's crew that brought it back that's actually now pretty solidly contested thanks to DNA evidence utilising crazy technology, grinding bones and retrieving DNA which is so hard to do because the DNA sort of structure mm. kind of goes down. So, But there's a history of syphilis or gonorrhea on Wikipedia that was mm. following the 1492 was when it appeared in Europe. Yeah, and that's the thing is that it still seemed to be relatively commonly accepted that that's when it began. Yeah. But maybe there's now light to suggest that. But I mean, it's only crazy recent. This is the problem with the Encyclopedia Britannica that are on the bookshelves. Once it's down from the time period in which it's discovered, it mm. instantly dates. And that was what we were saying when Brian Trenchard Smith is saying, don't see this. It's like. My question isn't factual, it's about the movie. So we agree no. with people kind at a, a party, party, and there's a woman stripping on a coffee table. Is that a house party? Like, where are they? It looks like a house party where someone's. Stripping, which and, and was it a hired person to come and strip, or did a guest decide this is what I want to do? Oh, so when you said house party, sorry, because you sent me a message as we we're going through watching oh. it about it being a house party. Yes, I took that as being a party in a house. Yeah, and I didn't sort of think too hard about what got her on the table. I didn't think she was necessarily a professional dancer. I kind of got the vibe that maybe it was a kind of party where occasionally you might jump on a table and dance and strip. Well, there's a bloke that um, gets naked at the end. Yeah, like just wanders straight through in a really awesome way and, as well. And hugs another man and it was yeah. totally fine. That was cool. So there's a lot of positivity in this film about sexual infections with close-ups of pustules and eruptions. Yeah. Well, a lot of the party guests are kind of watching the stripper slash dance with the kind of, hmm, yes, I see. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's always really like, hmm, okay. They're so not what I call move. into it. No, it's, it's more like... Kind <laughs> well, of, okay, it made two people run off and shag. What am I going to do when it's my turn? Right, okay, yes, fine. All right, she's already done that move. <laughs> I guess I'll recite poetry. <laughs> I have to remember this. There's going to be questions afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was probably just let's do generic swingers event things. Yeah, oh, right. Actually, no, it's not even that. It's let's get some tits on the screen under the opening credits. Yeah. Which We're, is what the film's about. If you about. want to suck people into an educational... Happy Valentine's Day. Jesus. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, Jesus. <laughs> if you want to get people to watch your educational film yes. that's targeted at men, that's yeah. a pretty basic way to do it. So maybe they had that really righteous idea of let's make it... Because the trailer I noticed was very sexy. It was explosions and then sex and jokes and then sex. I mean, there's not a suggestion for a second that you're going to see an ulcerated penis in the middle of your screen. It did or, come as a shock to me. Or a pustulant cervix. There are some, you know, we've joked... We didn't a, see a pustulant cervix. No, no, we, um, sorry, we saw an ulcerated cervix, an ulcerated devolver as well. Sorry, my apologies. We've joked occasionally in the past that certain sex sequences are more or less like, you know, medical diagrams. <laughs> These ones are genuine ones medical are. diagrams. In, in some ways, it's the equivalent of when school kids would go and look at the naked pictures in the health books in the school yeah, library. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in some ways, that kind of concept of, you know, fooling your audience, it's like, yeah, you know, market it with all the sexy bits up front, and then maybe they'll even learn something, said the writers and the producers and the executive behind closed doors. I love that this had a line, an all-too-frequent attitude among male chauvinists is that VD is basically the woman's fault. I did, mm. yeah. It was very close to a line saying X thousands of women in America may be infected and not known, so putting that whole typhoid Mary thing on yeah. it. So there were definitely sort of both ways. But for the time, I actually thought 
as a cis white male, it was surprisingly progressive. That's I, what they, were, they were like all the way through, even things like uh, at one point quite clearly on the fact that when they're talking about females being infected. So we've had a nice big stint of guys, you know, we've got some well-known, well, well-known, but we've got, you know, actors and people being themselves, admitting and confessing to it. And then the movie says, oh, but by the way, if you're a woman, there's still a massive stigma attached yeah. to it, which yeah. is true and awesome and good, good well, they, on them for calling that out. But near the start of the movie, they're talking to two women. I think, I don't know if they're at this same house party or not. Possibly it seem seemed to like be. It seemed like interviews in the kitchen. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. One of the women is saying she knew a girl that got an STI and she became depressed and suicidal. It's just that yeah. much stigma around it. And then we have that incredibly bizarre interview in someone's garden talking about how father came back from the... or grandfather came back from the Great War. That was and weird. I, it was father, wasn't it? Not grandfather? I think it was father, yeah. Oh, father, yeah. And, and it was always... And he moved on and he became a, a lecturer in a college and he was... But he always he, had it hanging over. Always had it hanging over. It was always such a stigma and we didn't know what it was all about. And it was really weird because... <sighs> Oh, interview- yes, and blame me the French, because the French went through... Ah, uh, the French disease, The French yes. disease. Which is interesting, actually, because they talk about that even to this day with the China virus, is Ooh. very early on, these kinds of diseases, people will attempt to target a particular group. And in some ways, it can actually make Our it very difficult. Our Prime Minister called it the Victorian virus. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, and it can actually make it quite difficult for epidemiologists and people trying to actually work out where this stuff has come from mm. to target it, because it's just it's the Spanish disease, therefore it's Spain. They've just discovered well, now... the Spanish flu. Well, the Spanish flu, which absolutely wasn't and probably actually, I think... It was America. Came up from America, yeah. Spain wasn't in the war, so they could freely report on it. Yes. So the information on the Spanish flu was coming from Spain. That's how it got its name. Oh, dear. Well, the early days of GRID, when... Of what? GRID, the old name for HIV. Oh! The G stood for gay because it was seen as this is such a the gay, gay disease. Cancer. Yeah, and yeah. Well, in fact, it was sometimes simply called the gay cancer. Mm. And actually, it, it's interesting because there's a segment in this film. We should probably describe it. It's an overarching story about the re rise of syphilis and gonorrhea. They are trying to explain that it, it almost went away and now it's come back. It With a series went away? Of, they were saying, you know, it was from the past, but now there's a resurgence in the time of uh, free sex. That, oh, did no. you? Yeah. Oh, okay. But, oh, yeah, no, no, you're right. Yes, yeah. they're saying that because of the 60s and sexual liberation. Yeah, and, yeah trying right, to say, sorry, pay more yes. attention, it's, it's coming back in a big way or something. Yeah. You know, when they have syphilis and gonorrhea lamenting about how they were nearly wiped out thanks to condoms in the factory sequence, which is that amazing. That was fantastic. But it is, it's a sequence of vignettes of comedy pieces and sexy pieces and nice, confronting... Nice doctor talking to us. Very nice this, doctor. Yeah. Dr. William Lopez, who I could find zero information about on oh, the really? internet. Mm-hmm. The problem with the way that they present the film... Uh, problem, but the way they present the film, it's very difficult to peg who is a real person, who is an actor, who is an actor portraying a real person. In the credits so the, it just says X so-and-so plays... Multiple, several roles. Several roles. Multiple roles. Yeah. yeah. And so it's very hard um, to know who's who. So we've got some well-known Australian actors. We've got Barry Lovett. We've got John Hewitt. We've got, you know, real people. Roger Ward. And, I mean, Roger Ward is like a fucking royalty for exploitation. You know, he's basically the stuntman. Grand Page is royalty for stunts. And in- it's Grand mm. Page is big on stunts. Billy Thorpe of the Aztecs at the time. And it's very difficult to work out who's who and who's paying. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of thought that most of the people who are ostensibly real current-day doctors were indeed real current-day doctors. They did actually say in the closing credits, with thanks to the New South Wales Sexual Health Clinic or something, for access, so... Thanks to the house that Jack built. The house that Jack built. Had you come across that before? The house that Jack built being slang for an STI clinic? No, I didn't. I'd kind of heard of it, but I haven't heard it for ages, so... Does that mean Jack isn't jacking off? No, if they were only jacking off, they wouldn't be getting infected. That's my thing. Well, that's I, my point. I don't yeah. know where it came from. Nor it's, do I. It was mentioned in the Dictionary of Australian Slang, but I could only find it in Russian. Right, because there were so many little references. I, I deep dived on so many different holes as we went through here. There's some of the, the slang Unless and Jack the Jack is John Thomas. Mm. Oh, of course. Yeah, that would make sense. Hmm. So, yeah, so possibly maybe similar to number 96, what we should do is we should sort of take a look at each of the vignettes in turn and discuss them. I have them all in turn, if you like. Oh, so do I. That was... Yeah, well, also, to answer your question earlier, that is why I think probably the raw facts they're giving are research to some degree, if not as accurate as they could be at the time. Mm. So 
while it would, of course, be easier just to make up some STI rate numbers for the various years and places, mm. it seems if you're talking to a bunch of STI doctors and things... They would have that information. Mm. Yeah, why would you not? I mean, even in 1975, if you forgot to ask at the time, you could call them up while you were putting yeah. stuff yeah, together. Yeah, that's right. I certainly got the impression that definitely the statistics and the facts and the medical stuff was real. I guess it was, for me, when they began to go down the road of the anecdotes and say, for example, you know, the interview about Father bringing it back from the Great War, it felt like that was an actress. So the storyline and those kind of, yeah, like I when they're talking know. to the teenager. Oh, I've forgotten her surname. Yeah. But she's a real people. Yeah. Okay, cool. I thought like I could go through the film and look at pictures of the person in this and try to identify them by the roles. I just like that's not going to work. Well, I had enough time tracking down Michael Lawrence. So he actually he was a character I really enjoyed. So in the second vignette, the first comedy piece, he's the one who actually plays the guy who eventually faints. And I was like, well, is that John? I don't know who that was. And then yeah, so uh, I'm so, pretty sure Brian Trenchard Smith was the bloke of the crab in his bed. I wondered about that. Shit, I wondered whether he was going to make a cameo, and I thought I was watching for him, but you might be right. That was fucking gutsy, possibly slightly stupid, putting a mud crab that close to your face without the claws rubber banded, because they can take fingers. They can take fingers and noses, and he picked it up correctly, but holy shit, that's actually a genuinely dangerous start to have an angry crab that close to the face. Maybe it's a case of... Or that close to his genitals. Well, there's that too, but at least he had covers over those. Yeah, he might have had iron underpants on under the covers. (laughs) Chainmail. So maybe it was like, well, if Grant's going to get his dick out on screen, the least I can do is get lobster feet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was what Douglas Adams did in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy when they were recording the TV series. And there was a particular point that's at the start where they're talking about not being able to find a way to be happy and one guy deciding that the dolphins had it right, they should never have left the oceans. They needed a naked person to walk into the sea and apparently nobody was up for it, as it were. So Douglas Adams did it himself. Well, they had a guy, but he didn't show, I think. Yeah, so basically he did it himself. Stripped down, walked into the sea. Yeah, good on him. So we have the first little vignette is this kind of opening sex sequence. This is how sex happens in this day and age. Isn't it so casual? I don't even know each other's names. She's more worried to make sure the door won't open and someone won't walk in. She has to be like reassured about that like four times. Yeah. Which is a bit interesting. She thought she was trying to ask something else and he was stuck on the door thing. Oh, okay. Don't you just put a sock on the door handle? Isn't that how it works? Well, yeah, but then you've got to remove your shoes and your socks, and he never took his socks off. He never took his socks off, you're right. Now, how are you familiar with the socks concept of porn? I don't know if it's an old wives' tale, but the idea that it was okay to show if the guy didn't take socks off? Why? I don't know, and I don't oh, even know if I've, it's true. I've heard variations on this that, of course, there's things like... You have to have one foot still on the... Yeah, and also, you know, the ground. if someone's wearing socks, they're technically not naked, and mm. granted, they are technically not naked. Yeah. So. I've heard that women wearing socks may have better odds of achieving orgasm. Oh, okay, just is that the, because of cold feet? Yeah, I mean, like yeah, literal, cold, literal feet, cold feet. Like the, the yeah, blood, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, I can totally imagine that. It's just a shame. Yeah, on guys in particular, especially if they're those weird business socks. They yes, at least he unsexy. didn't have sock suspenders. Sock suspenders. But yeah, there was this whole thing that I can remember as a kid in primary school hearing that, you know, it wasn't considered porn if at least one actor during the sex scene still had a foot on the ground rather than on the bed. I thought or that was the like guy a Hollywood kept the socks rule. On. Yeah, I don't know. From, yeah, it, it's all scrambled yeah, up there. And it's not going to make any difference in this because there's like full frontal penis. Because well, it's R-rated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's a thing going around that says they leave the socks on because there's no sexy way to take them off. Okay. Yeah, I don't believe that. I've seen Elizabeth Burton take granny pants off sexily, so <laughs> screw that noise. Or you don't need to have it happen on screen. Ooh. Let's just assume that the guy took his socks off. Off. If you really feel like you need to clarify it, have a sock fly across the front of the camera <laughs> before they walk back into shot. <laughs> Yeah, because whenever you want to show, oops, people took their clothes off in here, there's always a sock in yeah, there somewhere. That's yeah, right. absolutely. True. In fact, it's usually, you usually follow the sock first, which makes no sense. When you're tracking Look. across clothes on the ground, maybe I'm misremembering, but I it think... It goes shoes, then socks, then pants, then shirt or yeah, something. Yeah, it goes smallest pieces of clothing to largest. That no, it can't make any sense. No, no, it must go the other way. It must start with shirt and... Oh, anyway, I'll have to go back and watch a whole bunch of those slow panning shots. <laughs> that's not going to be weird and creepy. So sex happens... And we... She just definitely does not have an orgasm. No. Did you have an orgasm? Mm. Really? Mm. Has a smoke. There's no bed sheet on the bed, oh, yeah, I noticed. Oh, yeah, where were they going to ash the cigarettes? Just on the floor? Oh, Look, yeah, it's adults? the 70s. The world was an ashtray in the 1970s. That's true. And do we assume that infection has occurred at this point? I think this is partly the... One of the reasons the film exists is also the social sex on the screen. Yeah. And 
there's also a bit of illustrating. We now exist in a casual sex culture. Here's some casual sex. Yeah. Yeah. So one of them might have given the other something, but I don't think that's the point of the scene so much to say, Here's with so sex. much sex going on, sexually transmitted infections are getting sexually transmitted. Yeah. yeah. Because the narrative could have involved following one or other, or even maybe both of them through the various bits tying back to, you know, in between history and so on, of a plot line of learning about it. But yeah, so... Instead, we went to real-life sequences. So, yeah, I suppose in that respect it was a little loose, the tying of the various vignettes. You're just going about your business and then suddenly your tool drops off. Shit. You know why it's on the increase, don't you? Ignorance, mate. That's why. I remember watching educational films, like proper old school, on the projector. The projector would be wheeled to the back of the room and you'd watch it on the screen. And it would usually start with very few people know about the life cycle of a swan mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And in this, the example is just listen to any conversation in a bar and we cut to a bar. And Michael Lawrence, a nice gentleman business person who has come into the pub after a day in the office, I assume, bought himself a drink and sits down next to two Aussies, one of which is one of those pub experts, knows yeah. everything, and espouses to his mate. And Michael overhears. And he espouses largely nonsense. Yes, like if someone wears glasses, they've probably got a dose. Yeah, because the vision goes bad, apparently. And things like, you know, once that's it, once you've got it, that's it. It's all done forever. And you might as well hang up your penis. Can yeah. it be used for peeing anyway? So we have this guy espousing absolute nonsense to the point where Michael Lawrence's character just faints because it's so horrifying. In one point he talks about it's like pissing Are fish hooks. Are we to assume that he... The Peter Sellers looking dude has no I, infection? I think he's, he was just terrified. I think he just okay, got, got okay. completely... Well, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I took the same. He was just so terrified and, you know, given what he's hearing about a terrifying thing, he might even be thinking, oh, no, I've got glasses. Does that mean I've got the clap? Even yeah. though that's well, even I less logical. I had with last week. Yeah. And, well, I actually just also have to point out, everyone's really sweaty in this movie. The guys in particular are very shiny throughout this film. Oh, I didn't notice. I noticed shiny, but I didn't notice sweaty. A lot of the guys, especially Michael Except Lawrence. Except in the, um, the factory. Yeah, well, the factory, yes, which they're not. But the reason I asked about that whole sequence is because at one point the guy's talking about how, you know, it's like pissing fish hooks and razor blades yeah. or something, I think, and it's terrible. And then there's a half second and then the voiceover says... The facts are really more frightening than the fantasies. And then goes on to the, the film to say they're not. <laughs> I don't... I couldn't understand that because there's even at one point later on where they say pretty much everything can be cured. So you just had this guy talk about how terribly it had, horrifying it, it is yeah, for... and then say the facts are more frightening. They're not more frightening. Mm. No, That's... the facts are more reassuring because yes. everything is treatable. Yes. Yeah, unless they meant it literally that people are more scared of the truth than they need to be, I but yes, that's really an abstract reading and giving them more. <laughs> I, I suppose. And then first meet Dr. William Lopez, who is this lovely, lovely guy who sits down and talks us through the basic symptoms of infections of what syphilis looks like and what gonorrhea looks like in and men. how you catch it. In men, yes. And how you catch it, and how soon after sex it will appear, and and he gives you just a basic breakdown. And yes, there is a full frontal naked penis with a sore, and then there's a full frontal vagina with a sore. But he's quite factual about it. He's that kind yeah. of perfectly factual mm -hmm. level that you want a doctor to be. Mm -hmm. And then it's time to meet gonorrhea and syphilis face to face. And we go to one of your favourite sequences. It's fabulous. Syphilis and gonorrhea, are British. Gonorrhea, who is the... Oh, one of them is. One of them is yeah, British. At least not, none of them are French, I suppose. It's hard to tell because we're also... Yeah, we're, we're also doing coming the weird of, accent thing. Yeah, we're coming out of that tail end of the... Received the, pronunciation. The, yeah, the cinetone voice mm -hmm. accent, where the Australian and the British recorded accents are a bit kind of strong nods to each other. But yeah, we are in a factory, which is the inside of this guy out fishing... And we have our first, like, Monty Python sketch. Yeah, it is quite Python-esque. <laughs> you're right. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> you, you look like you're about to, uh, yes, I think about about to say it. something. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and so we have two workers. Or rather, we have one guy wandering around the interior factory who's gone a rear, who's already been there for a bit. And then Syphilis appears. And Syphilis, again, is Michael Lawrence. He's much taller. Looking a lot more like the character Hunter from that kid's TV series I talk about every now and again. Yeah, well, these guys basically look like first draft Mario Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. They really do. <laughs> Holy shit. So, and, yeah, and they talk about how the old times were better when, during the war, everybody would get it. 
And then there was the period with using condoms where suddenly it got quite hard for them, as it were. You're about to make it home or something, and then there's a big rubber wall in front of yeah. you, and then you're floating out to sea. <laughs> um, I hope that doesn't mean they were flushing condoms. Don't do that. Just put them in the bin. Yeah. One of them doesn't say, I'm not a seaman, does he? No. I'm not a sailor. Yeah, which is a shame, because they do actually talk about spermatozoa. And then they get pissed inside. And Yeah, they're just there I, sinking beers, talking about the old days and discussing which of them is going to infect this guy. Yeah, and I couldn't work out whether they were trying to suggest that if you've got gonorrhea and then syphilis comes on, gonorrhea goes away? Or uh, No, I just thought, you know, one has more identifiable um, symptoms yeah. than the other. So syphilis would show up quite quickly and gonorrhea would... Yeah, and mm. gonorrhea is basically saying he can work his work for yeah. ages before anyone will work out he's there. That's right. And yeah. syphilis is kind of making the case that he can make a bigger splash but might get noticed sooner. That's, yeah. Right. So syphilis is the short guy or the... I thought gonorrhea... I thought syphilis I was the tall remember. guy. I don't remember. I don't remember now. How's the old syph? Yeah, not too bad. How's the gonorrhea? <laughs> and um, they're talking about how busy they are and everyone's flat out and it's like, oh, well, I'll let you take this one. I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah, the product security. And then, unfortunately, we have the P word to describe homosexuals, just briefly talking about how they're yeah, all coming out that now. Was, yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that was like the only negativity, negativity mm. toward gays yeah. in this. And I'll be honest, it's only negative in our 21st century sensibilities, the use of that term in that particular environment uh, under those circumstances. That, was, pro- that, that wasn't a nice term for gay people in 1975. No, no, mm. But wasn't there a guy at a protest holding up the sign that said, I am a... <laughs> Sorry, yes, I am an F word, yeah. (laughs) Quite clearly trying to claim it, because wasn't there a thing about what word they were going to try and claim for themselves in the early days of being really proactive? Well, there was a lot of back and forth about that with gay. Yeah. Yeah, because obviously with the black community around the world really, you know, personally utilising the N-word amongst themselves to kind of claim it to a certain extent. You can argue forever whether or not it helped to do anything with the word. I know that there was some discussion about, well, how do we identify ourselves? And people got quite vehement about not using certain phrases to describe themselves. Well, gay was one of them for some people for a while. It seems unlikely now because it just seems such a neutral descriptor, but some people Mm. didn't like saying that about themselves or anyone else saying it about them. And, of course, there was the, but gay means happy thing, though Mm. Mm -hmm. often that was said by people who hadn't said gay to mean happy in like 50 years. Yeah, so. yeah that's and right. And it's a linguistic thing as well. They say, oh, well, that's got negative connotations. It's not the if word. If you're viewing it's... the community in a negative way, that's... every word's going to have a negative exactly connotation. Exactly right, mm-hmm. exactly right. So then the decision is made, do you make a decision on a particular word or phrase and say, fuck it, that's what we're calling ourselves. Yeah. And I change mean, your name to Cheery Cheese. I mean, even now, after a decade or three of communities and activisms, I do sometimes despair of the... I don't think the problem is what people are calling us. I think that changing the proper whatever we think the accepted word for us is every couple of years isn't actually solving the problem. It's just pushing it back for another couple of years. Mm. Until this new word becomes more problematic because we haven't mm. changed the attitudes behind the mm. identification process rather than the... I mean, people overnight decided transgendered was a horrible word and you had to say transgender instead. And it's like... They transgendered? Just... Yeah. Oh. That was just the accepted term for years and someone just decided, oh no, that's that's horrible and, and the cis made it up to other us and you can't have the past tense on an adjective and none of that's true. What? So they just dropped the ED and thought that was going to make it better. Yeah. Wow, okay. Look, I make no comment on that. It's not my... It sounds like they could have done with more. It's not my community. But yeah, (laughs) and that's... And I guess that's that whole... If you take a marginalised community, depending on whatever particular thing you look at, and you look at, say, money or whatever, if you can get them fighting amongst themselves then you've got less of a problem outside that community because they're, you know, splintering off and reducing their own numbers and removing solidarity from within. So, mm. But it'll always happen. There'll always be... There are people for whom the concept of allies rubs them really the wrong way, and especially things like the gay and lesbian Mardi Gras in Sydney, or the Mardi Gras, sorry, now, is very much meant to be a no straights, no no cis, we don't want you. It's almost you're not welcome. Again, not my cool. call to make one way or the other, but, yeah, is that particularly... I don't know, Callum, you did come out of the last podcast as intersex. Apparently I'm intersex, yes, yes. yes. I realise how grouchy I sound in response to that one, just because I know intersex people have, well, can't speak for all of them, some of the intersex people I know have spoken very definitely about people misappropriating the word intersex to not mean what the word actually means. You didn't come off grumpy at all. No. You had a hilarious response. Yeah, you were like, you you were were truly stunned that I'd done that. (laughs) It's a exploitation revelation. Simply my lack of pronunciation. 
are two little sexual people and they get pissed and then they have to get away before the ice cream falls all over them. Yeah, that was a bit gross. For reasons. And then, yeah, we have another voiceover. It then sort of talks about how these diseases are classless, but that 15 to 25-year-olds and also a new emerging group are susceptible, the International Traveller. Oh, yes. Because back in the 70s, the International Traveller was suddenly coming out into the world, as it were? I guess maybe that was when they really started well, that kind of executive business Well, maybe it was international travel was now affordable. Yeah, I suppose. Sex tourism. Yes. Yeah, globetrotting became much more an available thing to, mm. well, to the average consumer. Mm. Mm. And then we move into the story of Grant Page. And here's a question. I'm mm-hmm. curious. Grant Page, Roger Ward, Billy Thorpe, they're three semi-famous people providing anecdotes. Do mm-hmm. we... Especially Roger Ward. Do we think these stories are real? Do we think that the... I 100% did. The anecdote, okay. Yeah, uh, cool. basically there's no reason, no reason not, not to. No reason not to? Okay, cool. All right, yep. So we follow Grant Page as he finishes a shoot, but that wasn't The Man from Hong Kong, was it? Those sequences? Yeah, he's... Well, he's in The Man from Hong Kong, which yeah. is around this time. Were those sequences from The Man from Hong Kong? I, I don't know. I, I was curious. I don't know, but I've packed up my DVD, so I yeah. couldn't go look. No, even though the dates and location and the people involved would suggest Man from Hong Kong, apparently it's Kung Fu Killers. Oh, okay. okay. Cool. All right. Sweet. Oh, yeah. Like, he's done so much work. Mm. Yeah. And so he basically does all his stunt stuff, gets very, very active, and then he decides to blow off steam at the end of the production by going out and shagging some people. And he starts just going into the seedy red light district of Hong the Kong, which... bottoms I'll, up. I'll be honest, in this film, makes it seem like Hong Kong, and finds the Bottoms Up Club, which is famous. It was... Oh, I, yeah, really? it even appeared in a Bond film, the Bottoms yeah. Up Club. And it was exactly what you see. It was G-string, topless women... Mm-hmm. On tables, serving drinks, no touching, no anything. You sat down at a table, almost it was almost like a gaming table, and yeah. you got your drinks and you enjoyed the show. Um, yeah, mm. not even particularly dancing, as far as I could tell from the times I've seen yeah, it in whatever. Talking. And then they were like, yeah, and the woman, when he's actually talking to the woman, he actually says, Do you have any trouble? And she's like, No, 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 this is a classy joint. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And then this is the thing that made me wonder about the reality of the shows, of the stories, because if Grant's copped it, copped mm-hmm. a dose. A dose. Mm-hmm. They've then had to go back and film this as you now need to reenact all of your sequences. Let's go back to the bottoms up and talk to the... Cause you need to go and sleep with a syphilitic again. Well, yeah, I mean, not that level, but also we need to now recreate your I mean, they could have... Uh... Yeah, you're right. I mean, with the club, the footage could have been taken from behind the scenes of whatever film it was making, well, that's like when I'm, he's yeah. going over the cliff, but yeah. Because there's a certain level of cinema verite that I can't imagine Grant Page would have been prepared to actually uh, get into and, and, yeah, reinfecting. And well, Apparently there was spreading out some location filming and things between this and the aforementioned Kung Fu Killers. Okay, right. So I imagine if they did have to go back for some production reason or something, yeah. or if they knew they had both of these on the boil, I don't know. As it were, boils. Kill them. Sorry. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the thing. And, I mean, does then the actor say, oh, listen, I've got a dose, and Brian Trenchard-Smith goes, excellent. Perfect. Exactly what we've been looking for. Yeah. Please, can you show your diseased cock on film? Yeah. So... It's like a real close-up. So the logistics of recreating these <laughs> Grant things. goes, can't we get a stunt... Ma- Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> A stunt cock for your stunt cock. So, yeah, and it's... And he seems... He seems totally comfortable. Chill about it. Yeah, yeah, which is... And I guess it's another one of those things... He is a damn good-looking man, by the way. Oh, really? Speaking, oh, he was. No, oh, don't be wrong. I knew he was Short cut is. and built and everything. Mm. Yeah, but. in some ways it's kind of a shame that his main role in film is not to have his face seen at all. Mm. Yes. And he, <laughs> yeah. I've got to be honest, I thought his wry acting was really quite awesome too, so yeah. I'd be curious he's, to see... He's done a bit of acting acting, as in yeah. not just pretending to be someone else. Yeah. In the movie, old off cliffs and things. Maybe a little bit like oh, Patricia Tolman. No, 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 no. The Chuck Norris in his very early films. You play yourself, but you're still very much in a stunt kind uh-huh. of mm-hmm. role early on. Or oh, Jean Claude Van Damme did the same sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, you are your person. Oh um, yeah, Grant Page does that quite literally in in a movie. Oh really? He plays a stunt man called Grant Page. Hey. Oh, <laughs> 
Well, there's a car movie, the sequel to Gone in 60 Seconds, the original Gone in 60 Seconds with the 17-hour car chase, mm. with the guy actually playing himself after he's had all the success from the first film. He oh. jumps a Brickland motor car, which is the other gull-winged car. Anyway. Well, there's that Jean-Claude Van Damme series, called Jean-Claude Van Johnson, where he plays... <laughs> He plays film star and martial artist Jean-Claude Van Damme, who is also a super spy. Oh that's my god, that's that amazing! Exists. That's a thing that exists. That Brilliant. sounds so good. Because I'm reminded of Lee Majors' Fall Guy from back in the day, which I really loved as well, where he plays a stuntman, but he actually is acting as a stuntman. After so. this movie comes out and people have seen it, how are people treating Grant Page down the pub? So that was actually what I was kind of curious about. The movie itself talks about the fact that there's less of a stigma on guys than girls back then, mm. and as we know, that's still yeah. the case. Mm. And there's a certain level of a feeling from specifically Grant, Roger, and uh, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs that it's almost a little bragging. You know, I went and enjoyed Hong Kong and I got myself a dose. And you know. I didn't get it as braggy. Well, like, I just no, got I got it a bit braggy open. from Billy Thorpe. Yeah, oh, gotcha. yeah, yeah, yeah. Billy yeah, Thorpe yeah. was like, all the sex that happens. You know, you'd go off stage for a water and there'd be girls in the cupboard and girls under the table. He's like, and... I got the clap. That means I had sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the interviewer asks, did you take advantage of that? It was something a little bit low key. And Billy Thorpe so, basically no, said, no, we fucked the hell out, the hell out, out of it. Yeah. So, okay, cool. Yeah, so what we have now is we follow Grant Page. So Grant's been to Hong Kong, comes back to Australia. A couple of days after he's come back, he becomes aware of a discharge in the shower. So we get to see naked naked Grant Page having a shower. And then, yeah, we are showing, I guess, a reenactment of visiting a VD clinic. And mm. as we were talking about before, we suspect the clinic itself might be a real place. One of the things I noticed, which was really kind of funny, was, you know, it, it tried to destigmatize the concept of visiting these places because the voice I was talking about how, you know, it's all right, they'll be treated very common and, sense. And talking about the anonymity. Yeah, which was really funny because I noted down, the voiceover says, Grant is now assigned a number. This is the way he will be known from this point onwards to avoid embarrassment. Cut to him walking into the surgery and the doctor says, so what's your name? Age? It's like literally the very next piece of dialogue on screen is name and age, which makes sense once you're through the door. What they're trying to say is in the main room you're only referred. Well, they were saying that people give number. false information at the front desk because yeah. they're fearful. and Which is counterproductive when you're dealing with a plague. So there's a suggestion yes. that they, a certain level of it is catching infection rates. And then, yeah, so he goes through the initial questions. And something that struck me was the doctor asks, have you been vaccinated recently? And he said, yeah, I got the smallpox vaccination. In fact, when you actually look at him in the Bottoms Up Club, he's got what I thought initially looked like a bullet wound. I thought it was some oh, kind of stunt bullet wound. Smallpox I think it's the old vaccine. smallpox <laughs> And it was interesting because the doctor says, oh, going overseas, are you? And he says, no, 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 I've just come back. So clearly at that stage in 1975, you only got a smallpox vaccination in Australia if you were heading overseas, as opposed to everybody got it. And I thought the point was that it was a pretty ubiquitous... I don't know. You don't see those marks on the arm anymore. No, not at all, because we all but wiped out smallpox, because... Mm. We weren't so fucking stupid back then. And, yeah, so I guess by that stage, maybe a story... Well, even now, you get boosters on your existing vaccinations when you go overseas to yeah. certain oh, things. So maybe, it was a, maybe it was a smallpox booster. He did, did say that. Yeah, that's a good point. Because I just remember thinking that's really weird at the time. Because I never got a... I don't think I got a smallpox vaccination. Uh, you don't. I don't? Okay, no. cool. Yep. It seems to have stopped at people just that little bit older than us from yeah. what I've... Just going from people's ages and whether or not they have the relevant scar. Yeah, so mum and dad both. Because Australia is one of those places in the current situation with COVID sort of highlights it, that we're able to isolate and we've always been quite proud of that Because your fact. parents would have got it done in England. Yeah, yeah. I'm 100% certain that they both. And I'm curious that I didn't get one in 1974 in the UK when I was born. So, yeah, it was just something that sort of jumped out at me, especially considering we're talking about infections and disease and stuff. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, we get to see some discharge, although not from his penis. It's actually some other random dude's... Stunt cock. Stunt cock in a little different thing. Maybe and, couldn't discharge on cue. Well, I guess not. Maybe because he wasn't actually infected Infectious, by that yeah. stage. <laughs> and we find out about a third disease. So we've been talking about yeah, gonorrhea. Yeah, it's only been and, gonorrhea and syphilis. Yes. For like, ages. And now... It, Mom's specific urethritis arthritis uh, has symptoms very much the same as gonorrhea, perhaps on a slightly lower scale. Um, in non-specific urethritis, you have a burning pain on passing urine. And you also have a discharge 
a pus-like discharge from the tip of the uric- of the penis. Never heard of before. No, which is apparently still around. Yeah. So, yeah. This movie says women can't get it, but WA website said we can. Yeah, and again, probably that's just dated information from the time, I'd say, that in retrospect, yeah. looking later. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... In- I think we got the vibe that women are too complicated. Let's focus on the blokes. Yeah, well, it wasn't that long ago, and this belief still persists outside of medicine and science, that it was thought that cis women having sex with each other couldn't transmit diseases at all. Right. Oh, okay. And, well, they can. Yes. Well, that's interesting, because in this, when they're actually talking about homosexuality, there is a brief reference to females engaging in fellatio. So maybe, again, this movie was slightly ahead of its time progressive-wise, accepting, you know what, sometimes girls can catch stuff too. But, and then he carries a pint and a half of wee back to... He, oh, that was the weirdest samples. And why why ten not mils in, send him no. to a bathroom instead of, can you just pee over the sink? I, I, mm, yeah, good Surely question. Surely there are performing on command issues there. Well, that's possible too, but he he's did a say, I'll man. try. Yeah, he did, he did joke about I'll try and then brought back 17 gallons of the stuff. <laughs> well, it measured in inches. So. Yeah. The yeah. one that was really weird was the 10... Oh, I know why, sorry, yes. There's the 10 mils in the first and then the remainder in the second. Three because inches you, in the first. Yeah, yeah, you want that first little sample. That's the first bit that's not as diluted. Whereas the rest, it's when you're trying to test for anything, drugs is the same as well. When I, a Pregnancy couple of times is I've midstream. had a drug test. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Basically, different parts of the string give you different things with different results. And then we go back to Dr. Pez, who seems overly to be enjoying the horror tales of sounding yeah. during, during the wartime. Like, if he just went to schools and showed people that equipment, no teenagers would be having sex. If he showed most people that equipment. <laughs> Because those things were not small. He says that sounding doesn't happen anymore. And for all I know, he might be right. Probably does in a bunch of countries. You can still buy sounding equipment. Wish keep trying to sell them to us. Yes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wish think I have like 90 fetishes. <laughs> <laughs> I joked about that ages ago. I went through a stage, Wish would show me something brightly coloured and no description, and I'd click on it to find out what it was, and it would either be fishing lures or sex sex toys. toys. Uh, Very occasionally it would be anodised bolts for an incredibly specific part of a dirt bike or something, (laughs) and then the algorithm just went nut bar crazy. So Yeah, Wish is quite random. Like it says, here's a set of tea towels. Here are some shoes. <laughs> Here are some pyjamas made allowance if you're an adult diaper fetishist. <laughs> <laughs> then it's like, Wish is like, I don't know what you want. I like, just stop showing me random shit. <laughs> so yes, yes, when the algorithm disappears up its own ass. But yeah, he does go deep in, and yeah, some of the larger ones, uh, yeah. the dilation sounds were large, and of course the ones that are designed to actually go into the bladder, and I know that as well as the infections which they're talking about, which he talks about it trying to, the infection would apparently close off the urethra, they were also big for stones, so, well actually yeah, they actually use sound, sounds in, in that too, where mm. you can hear the, mm. and yeah, you sort of push it in, yeah. and apparently you would tap against oh, the stone. And, mm. These days they use sound. Yes. Uh, also... Hang on, why did I say yes like I knew that? They use sound, like actual sound sound now. Ultrasound. So Ultrasound. Cool. Because we were talking about them called sounds, because the, the doctor even makes a joke about how we're not talking about sound. Little did he know. Or for bladder stones or kidney stones, I forget which, sit up the back of a roller coaster and take a few rides. Really, really? The vibrations. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. But that doesn't still help you pass it. That just knocks it loose, right? It breaks it up. Oh, it breaks it up. So Which, it actually comes out small. Oh, good. Because I understand that even in this day and age, passing a kidney stone is still painful AF. Yeah, I've heard that. Mm. Yeah, I had to have the whole assembly checked over last year. And Oh, no. Oh, oh that stones? sounds awful. Well, nothing in the long run except some irritation slash inflammation. But because it was such a minor thing, they spent ages finding it. But which, that meant I learned a lot about how they scan for all sorts of things. 90% of which is ultrasound. Oh, right, there yeah. you go. I, yeah, I've been ultrasounded when I was getting the pain down there. I was sort of ultrasounded in Helen, the Helen, you kidney. just sit down there. Sorry, I, I realise, yes, I mean, I mean my liver area, mm. yeah. yeah. And which still they don't know what it was. Anyway, so we have our nice little description of sounds, and the one in particular, the umbrella Do sound. Do we need to that... explain that a sound is a rod that you pass into the urethra? Yeah, actually, yeah. we've kind of been going on as, yeah, as if everyone knows what a sound is, but yeah. we barely That's knew when we watched the movie. I I knew by then for reasons, but... Yeah, so it's basically, it's a long, thin piece of metal, and some of them distressingly less thin than others, which are passed down the urethra for a variety of reasons, and they look like... To clear blockages in this case, Mm. and you start with the slimmer one, and then you work up to the thicker one, and 
late. You've got a really bad blockage. You get one that's got kind of a, a soft curve at the end. Which you kind of sort of feed all the way down, which like a crochet hook. Why yeah. did he say it's like an umbrella? Well, the last one was like an umbrella because it expanded. Did you not see the last one? No, I did. I don't know. Isn't there a better example of something that expands than an umbrella? Well, no, because the way it expanded was it was a series of thin rods that when he pulled on the end, I see, I mm. expanded out in a mechanism that looked similar to the way an umbrella opens. Right. Yeah, and mm. also he possibly thought, what's a thing that expands that everyone watching at home or watching in a cinema will know? An umbrella. Yeah. If he just says expands like and then names another thing that people don't know what it is. <laughs> He's well, not getting paid by the word. I, I thought <laughs> this is a Twitter. I thought he actually called it an umbrella sound. I thought it was actually known as, as that. But yeah, I mean, who Yeah, knows? I think it, it was known as that. Yes. The hockey stick and the umbrella. Yeah. They were the nasty ones. You called, my lord. I did. On your knees, woman, and tell me what you see. Howdy, madam. Well... I see Your Majesty's feet. Up higher. Your Majesty's knees. Up, up. You mean... I do. Can't do it myself. My belly's in the way. Take you a good look, madam. Well? Ah! A pox on you, madam. Watch you, that candle. Twas only the hair, my lord. Well, lucky for you. Well, what is it you see? Tell me. This is what I think it is. Is my lord Henry the Eighth? Henry the Eighth. This whole medieval sequence, holy shit, <laughs> which I loved. <laughs> it was incredible, and it was a nice little central anchor point for the film. But the movie now begins to really kind of labour under the delusion of education. <laughs> yeah, it does fuck off in a rather odd direction. <laughs> yeah, it, I think it's also possibly trying to add comedy sketch show to its cap. Yeah. Yes. This felt like the most Monty Python-y part of the Monty Python-y style of the uh, comedy I thought bits. the gonorrhea and syphilis in the jumpsuits in the factory was, but this... I got that a bit more of a two Ronnies vibe. Oh, okay. Is that just because there were two of them? Well, yeah, but there was also <laughs> that kind of dialogue sort of thing that the Ronnies used to do. They'd have those weird little conversations with each other every now and again. Yes. Um, Sometimes where I think it's if you long... read it, it wouldn't be funny. Yeah, exactly. I think it's yeah. too long ago for me to clearly remember. Like, I, I would have watched the two Ronnies forever ago. Think about Whereas jo- Monty Python is repeated so often. Yeah. Mm. Maybe think about John Clark Brian Dore in context of oh, the yeah. two of yeah, gonorrhea yeah, and syphilis. It. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So that's it. Whereas the Monty Python stuff, the only thing missing were, were pages clacking coconuts together. Because yes. holy crap. <laughs> so we have our <laughs> history lesson in the middle of this. Yeah, well, Henry VIII is famous for, like, seven things, and the only one of them isn't a wife. Yeah. And that's having syphilis. Nice, love it. (laughs) We don't know which... Well, I don't know which queen it was that... Oh, that was looking up his junk. Mm. It'll be the one who survived him, I guess. Not necessarily. She just delivered bad news. Yeah, that's true. Even in that realm, I can't imagine that the queen would have gotten down on her knees in front of the king in the middle of a, of a great big throne room. I certainly think at least somebody else would hold the candle. Because I did get very much a maid vibe from her. I got a very low-key... She wasn't too well-dressed for a maid? But just the total difference. In the difference. apothecary's sister was incredibly well-dressed. She was, and mm. also had all that big boobage, which may or may not have been accurate but I mean, at the time. Was... The Queen looked a lot like Anne Boleyn, but I would be surprised if she doesn't <laughs> just happen to look like the first actor they could get to play the Queen. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yes. yes. So we learn about how Henry VIII had it, and it was treated with a variety of different things. Different terrifying yeah. things. While suggesting at the same time that maybe the apothecary poisoned him because he was making eyes at his woman. There was a bizarre little subplot. I've got to be honest, the writing in that was really good. I actually really liked... I'm not going to say it was Shakespearean, but it was very... Given that it was meant to be a kind of a comedy piece, mm. I thought that they did a really good job of mm. well, the Michael, a period stuff. piece. Yeah. Michael Lawrence handled the comedy bits. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, and he, of course, is the apothecary in this. So we've got the king sweating in this device. More sweating. Very any Anything with Michael Lawrence in, there was a lot of sweating... <laughs> We don't have to guess wearing that outfit and mm. all those. And then he stuff. has to sweat for another ten days mm. while wearing this tincture. And it was really interesting because it was done so very light-hearted. It took a lot of the fangs out of the treatment method that he's describing. But how historically accurate was that? I didn't. I assumed it so to, this be was part to be comedy, comedy, comedy uh, only. Not I. Yeah, well, they were circling accuracy. Okay. They yeah. weren't made up out of whole cloth. 
Right, because I certainly got the idea of like things like tinctures and things which would have mercury and turpentine and stuff. Yeah. I know would be kind of treatments for anything and everything. Flea down the cock would seem very specific for it to not maybe at least at the time have been something people thought was real. Well, sweating out stuff was huge. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 and blood, bloodletting too. Ones. Yes. There wasn't much in the way of bloodletting on that no, one. No, we didn't have leeches on I the didn't, Yeah, I saw no... I, I remember thinking it was a bit weird there were no leeches, but as I said, there were references to fleas and louses mm. being stuck mm. in places. And then, yeah, and then the bath itself actually sounded really quite nice. Have a bath in lavender and... After ten days of something. sweating, that bath would be fabulous. Mm. Yeah, but like that Um Yinko guy who only ate prawns and rock melon and then demanded that his followers all drink his bath water. Yikes. So yeah, so we have the breakdown of Henry VIII and then it sort of cuts to, sadly, he died and then we have... The Siege of Naples. Siege of Naples. Filmed at the castle in Ballarat with the assistance of... Did you see this? Yes. Yes. The Viking Society of Australasia. Does it still exist? It does not. Oh, does it not? No. In this day and age of Viking... Man, they'll they'll be sitting there going when the Vikings TV series kick off. Why did we ever do that? Okay, so there was that and another group which was for like ancient martial arts or something okay. and people from those went on to form a new society that is current. Now is that the SCA? No it's not, it's got a weird name that I don't know if I can pronounce right Okay right, so they are still reenactors and things They're specialist information it Sounds like spies <laughs> And I'm certainly with Daria on this one. I think a large portion of why this is such an involved sequence is where we've got a castle and a bunch of people willing to dress up and reenact yeah. a big battle. Because it did not need to go on as long as it... It's awesome that it did. I'm not shitting on the scene itself. And there's even superimposition, possible minor digital effects. I noticed there was a sequence where the camera's following a group of people running and then an explosion happens in the foreground yep. that's still as the scene happens behind. So some kind of post-effect stuff is happening, which means people sat down and worked on this sequence and put oh, some time and energy into it. I do just have to say one thing about the grandly named Viking Society of Australasia. It was a small group in Melbourne. Oh, was it? Didn't seem that small on screen. <laughs> Did they do a lot of that thing where they would run past and then run behind the camera and run past again? <laughs> the cat is in the basket. I was thinking that too. Oh, of course you were. Of course Boop. I was. And so the reason we're seeing any of this is the suggestion that, as we were talking about before, Christopher Columbus may have brought syphilis back to Europe. Because apparently the first outbreak of syphilis in Europe was in 1494. Mm. The first effective treatment wasn't until 1910, which was an antimicrobial agent, until penicillin in 43. Yeah. That's a lot of suffering in them years. Oh, yeah. Mm. And syphilis suffering is not good suffering. No, that just kills you, don't it? You You go mad. Yeah, and 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 you look gross, and it's horrible, and, you you know, your teeth fall out and all sorts of stuff. mm. It ain't a good one, in so far as any of them are going to be great. And yeah, and then we get to talk about the, the inherent racism in the in France, calling it the Nepalese disease, and then and the, the... Italians calling it the French, French illness. Yes. There was actually, I did just miss this, there was a sequence during the Henry VIII bit where the guy turns to him and says, it's your turn in the barrel. Do you remember the apothecary turns to the king and says, you might say it's your turn in the barrel when he's talking about uh-huh. sweating. And it, that turns out to be an old phrase. Talking about really? it, yeah, uh, it's an unpleasant experience, often involving assaults from others, and supposedly may have come from kids playing a game where you take turns in a barrel and everyone else would throw dirt and stuff at you. But it was said in a way that just I remember looking, thinking, and going, "Is that a thing? I've never heard of that before." No, me neither. Yeah, well, apparently it is. Yeah, there you go. Or was he sweating in the barrel? Well, he was sweating in that whole thing. But for the apothecary to say, "You might say it's your turn in the barrel," hmm. it seemed like a really pointed phrase, and it turned out to be a thing. Yeah, yeah. I've never heard of it. And also during the feasting sequence with the people in the New World, the Templar symbol, did you see the red symbol on the white shirt that mm. the guard had? Looked a lot like Serenity. Looked a lot, oh, really? It looked a lot, like, <laughs> a lot like the spaceship from Firefly in sort of a stylized, <laughs> awesome. sort of top-down view. Yeah, so we got this kind of notional historical, this is where it came from. And when I was reading about syphilis, it also said that at the same time there was a resurgence of diseases including yours and bejel, or bejel, yours, Y-A-W-S, and bejel, B-E-J-E-L. Hmm. Yeah, both hmm. of which are these kind of ancient sort of diseases in our brains that are apparently making a comeback. So. Oh, great, that's exciting. Yeah, yes. Making a comeback, eh? Excellent. Making a comeback. Um, so we have an incredibly elaborate, incredibly detailed fight sequence where everybody has a ball. It seemed almost a bit like they were maybe trying to punch that location as a potential filming 
site, you know, trying to say, hey, look what you can do here with some special effects and stuff. Yeah, I yeah, it came that, out quite it well. totally had that vibe. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think that castle must be used in a lot of stuff. Yes. Oh, yeah, it it had become one of those, hey, it's that place yeah. things mm. you recognise, like Vasquez Rocks and Monument Valley. Sweet. Is it still there? It would be, wouldn't it? Vasquez Rocks, yeah. No, not Vasquez Rocks. The castle, yes. The castle. <laughs> yes, yeah. I assume Vasquez Rocks are still there, unless somebody's made a point of getting rid of them. They're not going anywhere very anytime soon. No, they did a cute thing in Star Trek Picard after all the standing in years of random alien planets with this distinctive rock shape on them. They actually had a part filming there which was set at Vasquez Rocks, yes. California Earth. Yes, his old offsider is drinking herself to ruin right next to Vasquez Rocks. And they also did it with Star Trek, the cartoon series. What's that one that's just dropped? Lower Decks. Lower Decks. One of the first times they've oh, been down to the that? planet, they have Vasquez Rocks in the background. And so I didn't know what Vasquez Rocks were at the start of this conversation, but now I'm picturing them exactly. You know exactly yeah. the ones we yeah. mean, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. Sort of it was one line. of those surprising things where I didn't know I knew it until I was watching some random Star Trek episode and went, oh, hey, they used Vasquez Rocks. Wow, I don't know what Vasquez Rocks are called. <laughs> <laughs> Knowledge picked up by osmosis. Were they used in Galaxy Quest as well? I would not be surprised, but I don't actually know. Yeah. I know they were used in Belente's Bogus Journey, and they really rammed home that they were doing it by having the guys watching an episode <laughs> of Star Trek that featured them prominently ah. just before they were taken there. Presumably, when they were taken there, were they supposed to actually be Vasquez Rocks, if they're in California. And I think they were used in Paul as well. In fact, I think oh. Simon Pegg and Nick Frost jokingly reenact the fight scene with the Gorn at that location, the Gorn being the lizard creature. I think they're also referenced in Cars as well. Hmm, anyway. So, slight... Slight? <laughs> Massive side track on that one. Well, well, dear listeners. And hopefully you are well after that taster. We've had quite a ride already, haven't we? A few chuckles here, a little seepage there, and even a jolly good routing. I'm... I'm sorry. I mean, routing. Because, of course, what says serious discussion about the dangers of unsafe sex more than a medieval reenactment society sacking a pretend castle outside Ballarat? Whether you're grooving along with gonorrhea or shaking your tail feather with syphilis, there's always a party happening somewhere in the world, and those two characters may well be hanging out. So let's freshen our drinks, give ourselves a good rinse off, and return to the seedy story of the spunky 70s. Yeah, big fight sequence, and then we move on to colonial Australia. We cut to a reenactment village. Somewhere. Yeah, it, there the was women a... being sexually assaulted in the street is what we cut to. Oh yes, yes, yes. But that's you know, women were in short supply. Yes, women and doctors were in short supply. <laughs> so there were yes. SDIs running rampant. Running a brothel was a license to print money. Yeah. So what we have is a couple of minutes of the Australian equivalent of what Deadwood would be if you took out all the storyline. <laughs> and again, this is some lack of budget because while there are some old timey looking dresses, most of the men look like they're just wearing footy jumpers. Yeah, the dyeing techniques in colonial times were very good. There's some <laughs> really crisp, bright coloured lines on the various shirts around. As we joked, one of the first people that kind of jumps out looks just like wears Wally without sleeves. He's, he's got this bright red and white striped top and blue trousers. I don't think they're actually jeans. They're some kind of cotton, but yeah. I don't know if actually they're blue trousers or not. But yeah, certainly the bright red and white striped top. And we get He must told, have been really rich. Oh god, yeah. Ford Red. Blue would have been the only thing that it would have made him richer. Mm. Or it wouldn't make him richer, it'd make him poorer. Because... Anyway, so we have this little <laughs> sequence to bring it back to Australia, I guess, because we spent an awful lot of time overseas and yeah. we need to make it all about Australia again. <laughs> and we learn that, gee, what do you know? When people fuck around a lot, there's a lot of disease. So yeah. gonorrhea in particular is what they're talking about at this point, being rampant in towns like Ballarat. Which, it's one of those things I've never realised until I watch this. Ballarat in my head is somehow... About 1850. It's 1850s, 1880s in my head. Right. You if don't I think w- Ballarat currently exists? No, no, no. I've realised that my brain... Thi- when they when it hears... Ba- when they... <laughs> Day. When with it your hears, plural brains. When, when my brains... When it hears Ballarat... It goes Gold Rush. It goes Gold Rush. And maybe if... Just maybe like early 1900s. It, it is. It's a town that for some reason is just... Uh, I mean, look, a lot of historical stuff happened in Ballarat. I mean, that's where we got our union movement really took off and all that fun stuff as well because of the mining. But yeah, it's one of those towns that just, for me... It says, just never modernised. Never modernised. No, if I went through Ballarat and there were horses and like, the entire <laughs> town was just a reenactment village, perfect sense. Make perfect sense to me. Sorry to any listeners in or around Ballarat. <laughs> <laughs> I love 
you all. I was going to say I love Ballarat, but I haven't been there, obviously, in ages. I mean, Australia did that for a while. There were about two or three places. What was the one just out of Sydney? Uh, it was actually called Old Sydney Town. And it was, so a, it was a reenactment village. It was a reenactment village, yeah. Oh. And people, you know, you made hard candy and a couple of times a day you'd have bush rangers come in from outside. And it, it was one of those places that you just went. And I guess if nobody was there, then the people wouldn't have to do their thing. But most of the time you just went in and you wandered around the village. And as I said, look at someone making hard candy and then look at a blacksmith doing mm. shoes. Mm. Uh, and I think there was one obviously down in Victoria as well. But, hmm. Sorry. They probably don't exist anymore because we can just look it up on the internet. Bloody internet. <laughs> Damn you. Well, VR's kind of cool. I was going to say, you can probably just plug it into Oculus Rift now. And... Yay! That would be so cool. Oculus Quest now. Oculus Quest. Oh. Mm. Rift Quest, Rift all of the above. Oh. And then the voiceover cuts to nowadays... And we cut to the 1970s, which is so fucking funny when you're watching something like this. So nowadays, and we now cut back to the, 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 the house swingers party. party, the house party, which I know, it just, it made me laugh. This is where we came in. This is where we came in, yes. And we came in 50 years ago. Yeah. 43 years ago. 46 years. 40, no, hang on. 1975? Yeah. Filmed 20, in 74? 25 Oh, then it's 47. Callum, it's your age. You are born in 74. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. We're just a couple of years, guy, 50 years. Yeah. Mm. Oh, my God. Anyway, so we're back to contemporary times, a.k.a. the early 1970s, and the line that was really weird to me... Nowadays, there is no venereal disease that cannot be cured. Even though, like, two or three times, Dr. Lopez says, you know, we may be able to treat some of this. So, for example, this. urethritis... He says, you know, we may be able to treat it and we can treat the discharge, but it'll always be there and it may continue to come back. So oh, okay. even within the film, they've said there's some shit we're not curing, we're just treating the symptoms. Isn't that the same with, like, is it herpes? Yeah, well, most people who've got the herpes that gives you the occasional cold, or, you know, you, if you had chicken pox, you've got herpes. I mean, pretty much the majority of people have got herpes, whatever it is. I believe, sitting in their system. Yeah, you never get rid of it. It's just... I don't know. I've never had a cold sore or chicken pox. Really? Mm-hmm. You might want to get a blood test. You may... I may be special. Yeah. Did you get the rubella vaccination and nope. stuff when you were a kid? You didn't get vaccinated? No, I don't think I got rubella. Okay. D- did you get shingles? No. I got shingles. And when I got I shingles, laughed. a certain person who might have been my partner at the time said, oh, don't be stupid, it's not shingles. Only old people get that. I didn't think it existed anymore. I thought it went the way of Jane Austen. <laughs> Well, as I've said before, possibly on this podcast, you know, I spent some time in a university where occasionally they would have to treat people for scurvy. scurvy because because two minute noodles don't involve that much nutrition. No, when you take kids away from their home environments and you stick them in a university environment where they're suddenly on their own and fending for themselves, they don't eat fresh fruit and veggies. But yeah, so it was really weird that they're trying to explain the seriousness of these diseases and they specifically said cure it. And I wonder if they meant treat it. I think, again, without knowing, they may simply have screwed up cure versus treat. Yeah, Mm. yeah. And I kind of got that, that perhaps they were just talking about, you know, don't be scared. Go into a doctor and and sort this shit out. It's not terrible. Even though the facts are really more frightening than the fantasies. It's like... Very strange yeah. little mixed message here and there. And then we have our second of the real-life stories, Roger Ward. As we said, Ozploitation royalty. He, I guess the most common one people might probably know mainstream is that he was the bald police captain dude from the original Mad Max. Any Ozploitation film, he's in there in some form or other, just about. He was even as far as Boar. He made an appearance in that yes. one as well. And he tells a problematic story. He does not come out smelling like roses from this story. No, although he does lament what he did at the time. So basically, did he say he'd finished filming or something and jumps on a boat and goes to Fiji? Basically, just just jumps on a boat and goes to Fiji. He's on a boat to Fiji. That's what you do. Goes into town, finds a very attractive lady, brings her back. And apparently they have sex in the dark and don't turn any lights or candles. Yes. And in the morning, when he rolls over, he sees that although she's dark-skinned on the arms and legs and face, her body is pale and white, and he's horrified. He thinks that she's clearly infected with something or other, and turfs her off his ship. Yeah, now, rows it ashore. Rows it ashore. Mm. Doesn't give her a shilling to get back to work. No. Nope. And he says, you know, I felt out. really bad at the time if I could go back now, but, you know, what can I do? It's already been and gone. So, yeah, yay yeah, regrets there, dude. <laughs> and as he's rowing back to shore, he catches the eyes of a group of locals who basically signal, who did you have sex with this person? And he says yes, and they're all like, oh, we don't, we don't. So he's really worried for days, and then a few days he's later he gets... checking himself in the shower. Yeah, an eruption on his arm, and the punchline... 
for want of a better word, is that, as it happens, he just got a dose of ringworm on his arm, and the reason that the, the woman looks like that is she's actually partial albino. Or maybe full albino who does makeup on her arms and legs. It's a little unclear. No, he says part albino. Part albino. She has albinism. The way they describe it, it sounds more like vitiligo. Is it with the skin tone is just not... Melatonin doesn't sort of go somewhere, or the skin... Yes, where got, peels, well, or? the effect is often patches of darker and lighter skin. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so it transpires, I guess, the locals, because they're especially certain countries actually view, especially if they're dark-skinned, they view albinism as a really terrifying thing. There are horror stories of the way albino children are treated in some parts of Africa. So it may have been mixed messages, but at the end of the day, what we take away from this is that Roger Ward, famed Australian B-grade actor, had a Didn't scare. get the clap. Didn't get the clap. Had a... They made him think. It did. It did. At least briefly. Yes. And so, threw someone off his boat for being, being white, which is really an odd kind yeah. of story. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But the one thing I did take away from this, it's totally irrelevant to the rest of the plot of the movie, is that Roger was a really good storyteller. He was, he, wasn't he? I can understand why he was an actual... I mean, it could he was an actor. scripted, but... Well, this is the thing, and then this then comes back to how many of these yeah. are real, and, you know, especially the Vox Pop stuff of that yeah. second level. Are they scripted? You know, how many times did you go through, and are you given this piece to read? But yeah, he tells a story quite compellingly, even when you're going, ooh, dude, that makes you a little bit shitty. No, I think I'd he realises that. I think he does. Even yeah. then he realises. And, and I'll be honest, yeah, maybe that's the reason why Brian Trenchard Smith says you don't need to see this. It's like, no, 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 no. Some people don't come off better than they are. But of course, I would never say that to Roger Ward's face because he'd break me like a twig. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, dude. And then we have a weird sequence where we talk about crabs. Yeah, this was well, because we really haven't covered many different STIs. No. But then they go on to tell us scabies is an STI, which it isn't. I no. Mean, it can be spread sexually, but it's usually spread just through physical, non-sexual contact. Yeah, as I understood it at the time, crabs are basically just lice in the pubic region, so it can actually be I don't know, because you can have lice. lice and pubic lice. Okay, maybe it's pubic lice. All right. But yeah, we have this weird sequence, which up until this point, we've literally seen infected penises. We've seen discharges. We've seen open vaginas. And suddenly they won't show a crab. And in fact, it's really funny because the doctor's talking about if you could see what these things look like, you know, if we yeah. want to scare people, we put, it under, we, we put it under a microscope. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Because we've had some really, a couple of shots of vague slides that don't show anything at all mm. and we're suddenly squeamish about a crab given the known resource of this film we maybe didn't have such a sample available to show Actually, that's true not very much no no nothing I, I love the doctor saying people would come along with these in a matchbox and hand it to her and say what's this mm. yeah but, yeah, there's a very weird sequence in an Australian book called Candy, which was then made into a feature film with the late Heath Ledger about drug use. And at one point, there's one chapter where the couple discover that they've got crabs and they spend an afternoon shaving themselves and then picking each crab out and killing them and getting the eggs as well. Sort of that kind of, with that, like, mega focus concentration that a junkie can get on some things at mm. times. And yeah, as with most of the book, a compelling but still also really disturbing it sequence. It disturbing, yeah. But it is really good, and Candy is an incredibly well-written book and a decent film too. And then, yeah, like I said, bloody, if we assume possibly Brian Trenchard-Smith himself, whoever the actor is in bed, waves a big crab with huge claws right in front of his I face. don't know what kind it is, but it's a big-ass crab. It's a big-ass yeah. crab with some big-ass claws, and it was not particularly happy, and that was very close to the face. So, <laughs> kudos. Fred, a dose, not morose. I've got VD. Ah, oh, shit. I've just come from a doctor. Fred, I've been two weeks away. What am I going to do? I've only been back a couple of hours. I mean, I haven't even been home yet. Commercial travellers. How am I going to tell Doris? Take my advice. Don't. But I've been away a fortnight. She'll expect. Well. Right. And then after that, we cut into another humour sequence where we find about the international traveller. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, this is the adulterer. Yes. This is Harry. So Michael Lawrence. Do we know the name of the actor who plays the other guy? Because no. he's the bloke who was... Because I could never work His out... His character is the... Fred. Yeah. And I don't know the actor. Mm, because he's also the one who was waxing lyrical at the very start with all the nonsense information in the pub. Yeah. But yeah, so we have Michael Lawrence... 
who's caught a dose of something on what I guess is a business trip. It yeah. came across as a business trip. Yeah. Yeah. He just says two weeks away. We don't even know if it was international. Mm. But he seems to have stepped right back into his office over at work. Yeah. yeah. And then he calls, of all people, his, his brother wife's in brother. Law. Yeah. Yes. Now, it was really funny because when I first watched this, I was like, why would you tell her brother, of all people, that you've cheated on her? But then it hit me, probably they were best friends because it felt yeah, like Yeah, I thought that too. Of... But yeah, I also wrote, isn't that the last person you'd think to call? Well, possibly your second last person after your wife. wife. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I would think if your primary objective is wife must not know, then you do not call someone who is, call her brother. who's got a vested interest in... Mm. Mm. So yeah, that was really weird. But I guess, you know, when you've only got three actors, then you... Then you, you what would... do you call could have cast him as not his brother-in-law. I guess yeah, that's right. How many actors doesn't really he just... Yeah. Because the brother-in-law says to Harry... Oh, God, that's a good point. Don't oh, tell sorry. her. Yeah. But then he rats him out anyway. Yeah, and then at the end he says, you know, well, how do I to tell her? It's like, gently, you, you tell her gently. I don't know, maybe it was like a secret test of character thing. Yeah. To see and... if he would be truthful with his wife and with the trap waiting for him there if he wasn't. Mm, possibly. But at the end of the day, that's what's going to happen if you tell family. So, yeah, that was really strange. And then there's a line, which I got thinking about. When the brother's trying to explain, you know, what do you do? What do you say you've got a headache? Yeah. There's always the gap. Yeah. He says the line, there's always the gap. I didn't understand that. And I wasn't sure what that was. Now, it suddenly hits me as I'm saying this that maybe there was a point where people might jump off a cliff or something. There's a... Gosh, well, that still exists. Is that the Is suicide it... spot in Sydney, the gap? Maybe, maybe a suicide spot in Sydney the... and I think it's at the gap. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, right. Because I started down this path of noticing that they're still sleeping in two beds, even though the beds are together. Oh, that's just how television was. You... No. No? No. It turns out double beds only started becoming common around the 1960s. Prior to that, it was single beds, usually single beds pushed together. Queen-size beds and things were literally occasionally beds for royalty, but the concept of a couple sleeping in the same bed actually only apparently started around the 1960s as a common thing. So prior yeah, to that... Wasn't there a whole thing, the first show to show a the Brady- couple... I thought it was like the Monsters or something. The actual one, which gets forgotten... (laughs) The Flintstones. Further back. Ah. We are in 1947. Ah. Mary Kay and Johnny from Mary Kay and Johnny. Ah, okay. And I think it's the fact that either you or the listeners listening are about to say, who the hell is Mary Kay and Johnny, which is why not many people know that. I don't know that either. And they're in a double bed? Because that was what was really weird, because I... Because Mary Kay and Johnny were married in real life, so... Ah, so it wasn't seen as being such a... It's not as naughty as putting people who just know each other in bed together. So then I wonder... So Brady Bunch, although six children shared a single bathroom that lacked a toilet, the parents were never shown sharing a bed. Okay. And yeah, then the Monsters, 64. Oh, there you go. Because that was was the thing, because I was like, well, maybe it's something to do with the gap in the bed. That maybe there's a joke about you call down the gap or something. Because they were in separate beds, and I had assumed yes. that it was something to do with the fact that everybody was in separate beds then. But apparently, maybe now my information's incorrect, it was a relatively shallow scrape. But I typed in, you know, when were double beds first introduced, and not on television, just in general, and it suggested the 1950s, 60s. So well, was... that wouldn't be surprising. We're no. specifically talking about on screen here. Yeah, but maybe it is completely possible that in that day and age, real people, in inverted commas, were still sleeping in separate beds, even if they were pushed together. There was Maybe the beds themselves were still I mean, people used to separate. share beds all the time, mm. and like mm. you'd have several kids in a bed, so I assume there were big beds out there. Well, yeah, but I guess maybe what they did is they had single beds pushed together. It apparently was something to do with the technology involved in creating larger mattresses that were in a sprung. So the, but I don't know. I was trying to work out where the phrase "there's always the gap." But like I said, as I said it, it may be suggested to me more possible. And this was that... a Victorian film, wasn't it? Yeah. So the gap, Sydney, probably doesn't mm. make sense. Does Melbourne have a gap also? I don't know. So yeah, I just couldn't work out. As opposed to "it's your turn in the barrel." I didn't really get there's always the gap. Mm. But I'm pretty sure they're not talking about the Medicare gap. Well, no, pretty sure they wouldn't have it yet. No. <laughs> but didn't Medicare start in 75? 84. Huh. Shit. Pop Hawk was... Wow, okay. Hmm. 
And then... Also, that's not going to solve the problem of his wife. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you were saying that, yeah, you know, he starts a story to his wife about the paper on the toilet seats, yeah. which, as we know, is nonsense, and apparently wastes thousands of tonnes of paper every year in the States, which are bigger about it than Australia. Why would you believe that a tissue-thin bit of paper is going to protect you it's from nonsense. anything? And he starts this story, and... While he's telling the story about how he's not feeling very good and he doesn't particularly, he's very sensitive, she's coming on to him, coming on really strong. Yeah. And she runs her hand down his pants. Now, when you first see the story and you don't know the punchline yet, I was like, why is this story turning her on? Oh, I didn't. Yeah, okay. okay. Then when you realise the punchline, which is that she's already been told... Why would you want to touch it? And why would you want to touch it? <laughs> why would you want to... And give it a squeeze... Yeah, the squeeze I didn't get. Like, if her hand is travelling <clears throat> toward that area, I get that that's making him extra uncomfortable, so that's fun. Yeah. But, yeah. You know it's gross. You know it's literally diseased. But then, I guess, you just go wash your hands and it's fine. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, so yeah, so we learn that he should have not, well... That Harry should not have called Fred about Doris. Mm. Good God. <laughs> <laughs> if a sex worker later on, was her name Doris as well? Oh, I don't know. It might have been. Uh, the one with the guy who totally wasn't there for his first time. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. He's Dave or something. He's Dave. He's a really neutral name. And then she, after the cleansing ceremony is over, introduces her. I can't remember. No, she had like was. a really old school traditional name yeah, like Doris. Yeah. It, it was surprised he wasn't Beryl or something. My name's Gladys. How do you do? Or Sheila. But now we cut to another narrated info piece, kicking off with the fact that there's still a social stigma for women. Yeah, um, 58 minutes 20. Genital infections of any sort are particularly alarming to the married man. For a woman, the social stigma attached to VD is far greater than it is for a man. Mm, which is really woke for a film in this era. Yeah. I was surprised. I thought it was really good. And then we have the female variation of Grand Page. So we, I guess, assume interviewing a real girl who discovered that she'd got a dose from a guy that she'd only been going with for a couple of weeks. Mm, and, and then he dropped her like a hot potato. Yeah, and she goes to the house that Jack built, yes. same clinic, and she experiences the female version, which is with the... At least it's less graphic than the male it is. one. Well, mm. this one's definitely reenacted because she doesn't take her pants off. No, she doesn't. Mm. That's right. And also the doctor says to her that's not going to hurt at all it might feel a bit weird but it is a speculum and it's cold and she doesn't jump or she does anything she just smiles a little bit so uh... at one point she gives this amazing look to camera oh uh, yeah. yeah it was super yeah, weird yeah there were a couple of straight down the barrels it was um... what woman is talking just casually in convo to the person who's performing that <laughs> Don't know. No, I don't have them done. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're probably trying to make it seem less scary and make it look casual for mm. people. Oh, yeah, I found it really interesting because they said it's just like the pap smear. So mm. I didn't know we were doing that back in the 70s. I noted that as well. I was like, holy shit, pap smears back then too. That's yeah. really awesome. And then, yes, we learn about chocolate agar and we follow the sample on its little journey. Or is that during the grandpa? One of them. We follow the sample. I'm confusing my various tests. So she shows the patient the Petri dish. That's right. Yes, yeah. yes. A thing called chocolate agar, which doesn't have chocolate in it. Does it um, have agars? It does have agars. It's a special... <laughs> What's an agar? Agar is a growth bed for different types of organisms. Okay. So you sort of take a sample of something you think might be infected and you scrape it over there. It's basically sugars. It's a sugar that would feed up so that it provides the perfect growing environment. So you get a and much chocolate quicker... chocolate just refers to the colour, I presume. I guess it's probably, yeah. Because mm. I couldn't find any reference to it using actual chocolate. And so, yeah, so we see the testing happening and we see the growth part. Can I ask, are swabs still a part of testing? Or is everything done by blood and urine tests now? Well, yeah. it must be, because we've just been doing them with COVID. Yeah, do you mean at all? Oh, or? sorry, I mean for STIs. Oh, I don't know. I, I had an allergy test a few... Because this might not be a thing anymore. I had an allergy test a few years ago, and they didn't even do the old scraping stuff. They just took blood. Yeah. So they can do a lot of reactive testing with a very small mm. amount of blood, I think. Because so. mm. they do urine tests if it's a UTI, but that's sort of more a Venn diagram of STIs. Sure, yeah. And the reason for taking urine then is pretty obvious. It's in the name, really. Mm. Yeah. And that was what the guy was actually saying, is, you know, a lot of the symptoms can be similar, so you do that big old test and see what's there. But, yeah, even then they were saying, you know, the only way to be 100% sure is to do a blood test. Mm. But, yeah, I mean, I guess with those pap smears and things, so some stuff is... Yeah, but that's not a... That's not an STI. Mm. Yeah. Like a... Do you like a technological advance? Nice. 
And then we have the students, 16-year-olds. Yeah. So, so, so we're talking to some kids on a boat. Yeah. A couple of things struck me. First off is that you're actually filming genuine school students, and we know they're genuine school students because all the boys run in front of the bloody camera at one point, and there's <laughs> zero way that in this day and age those faces would not be blurred if they were even in this film, which they would probably not be. It would probably be one of those sort of, you know, across the street, unfocused shots completely of what's clearly a school and, and mm. literal just blobs kind of wandering around. Mm. Yeah, they do make films like this with and for teens, but they wouldn't have all the explicit hardcore nudity stuff. No. no. And then, yeah, we talked to a What's a carnal charge? So we're talking to the kids about STIs. Yeah. And they worry about you might get done on a carnal charge if you go in to get tested. I'm assuming it's a sex crime. and I'm Like assuming carnal be... knowledge of someone under a certain age or something? It's kind of what I got. We then learn a little bit later in the homosexual section, we're still at the very restrictive period of sex where a lot of yeah. sexual activity is a crime. And, yeah, it would not surprise me if you... Or even if it's not necessarily a thing that would have happened, it's certainly what would have circulated to school. It's like, oh, God, no, don't go to the hospital. Yeah, that's because right. if you if you go to the hospital, they'll fucking do you on carnal knowledge. I mean, that was yeah. the, the old... What was it? That was what fuck was meant to be an acronym for, wasn't it? For Fornicating under consent under, of the king. Or it's for, not true. Or for unlawful carnal knowledge. Carnal knowledge. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, which is also, I think, yeah, not as you true. say. Yeah, but, yes... And I'm going to say, there's some pretty amazing beards and sideburns on some of oh, those 16-year-olds. Oh, the next group of, oh, were they meant to be 16 as well? Because I just wrote, how old is the kid with the full beard? Well, this was actually funny because I started to write that down. And certainly the, one of the 16-year-old kids has got a really amazing sideburn, but he's also covered in acne. He's quite clearly a, a teenager. Oh, I didn't notice that. Then the way that the, the bearded guy is talking led me to think that maybe he was a counsellor or possibly Something even the interviewer. Because like. he seemed but, to be yeah, speaking Yeah, he was very knowledgeable. A, yeah, a position of knowledge. Yeah. And it was a really mature discussion for teenagers. It, it really was. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, look, it, it's weird. Yes and no. I can remember... I mean, you know, we're talking 80s, not 70s. But I do remember that when decisions were made, okay, today is sex education, they kind of got over the discomfort by just going hard and going frank. I do remember them being... (coughs) Look. Just jumping in, like, feet first and going, you know, this is the thing and this thing. And, yeah, there were some twee things. I do remember, you know, where did I come from, the book. Friendly Geordies talks about it in his education. So he's 31. You could just chuck questions in a hat anonymously. I do remember that. Primary school too, yeah. Uh I do remember that. And I remember that the teachers were instructed to be as blatant as... Because it's... I mean, again, we're talking the 80s, not the 70s. There was an awareness by that point that the kids you were talking to knew enough to be a danger to themselves without necessarily knowing enough. And Mm. to pretend that it was all very secret and, you know, you've got to be a bit coy and you've got to, you know, use special phrases. It was like, no, no, treat them like adults. There was a very mm-hmm. real impression. I mean, I, I was also public school and in Australia, public school means government schools, doesn't mean private school. So we got the government mandated health education, which yeah. was just treat them like they God knows what you get at on. Catholic school. Abstinence, 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 hellfire, abstinence. Maybe. Pretty much. So, yeah, so we have an incredibly beady guy hanging out with a bunch of kids. But, yeah. He's hoping for some kind of Saturday afternoon adventure show. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing that whole kind of, you know, pushing each other off the boat and everything first. And then it was really weird. I clocked as they were all sitting around talking. It suddenly hit me, holy shit, they're not smoking cigarettes. No. It, I, I was a, it was a genuine half second. Of, oh, hang on. No, that's just a biscuit or something. Because it was so in my head that that particular environment and those particular types of people in the 1970s, they will absolutely be smoking cigarettes. We could smoke in college in the courtyard. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I remember that. That was 94. Was the smoking age 16 back then? No, 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 the smoking age, like, it changed when I was about 15 years old or so. Okay. It went from 16 to 18. Yeah, wow. I remember it So going... I just missed out. I still remember when they went up to five bucks a packet thinking, I'm going to quit this. Five bucks a packet, five eh? Bucks. yep. Jesus. How much are they now? Good a scotch? billion dollars. Yeah, a good scotch. Good well, scotch. no. Uh, well, what's a pack? A pack is... 30. Well, it depends. I mean, you get a pack of 20, 30, 50. A pack of 50 is like $84 now. Jesus Christ. That's damn good scotch. Wow. You can get all the smoke in as you want from a damn good scotch. <laughs> and you can even have it on a windy day. What was your attitude when you had it? How did you feel? Oh, great. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> great frothing mass in your underpants. You know, <laughs> 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 quite a turn on, you know. <laughs> 
And so we have the last of our true stories of individuals. How the fuck, Brian Trenchard-Smith, did you get these interviews? That's the thing. I... Because <sighs> Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs seem pretty candid. Yeah. And as Daria says, and it's certainly the vibe I got from all three, and Daria said she got it most... I'm speaking for you, you're here in front of a mm. microphone. There is a brag factor here. This is the rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah, but getting STI seven times in 18 months is just ill. <laughs> but it is also seems to be coming from a, well, we don't do that anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. This it's was already the, Yeah, they're already mm. speaking from that. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. no. Yeah, back in the day, man, the women were falling <laughs> out of the bloody cupboards and shit. But... How stigmatised must condoms have been... For this isn't just one person, this is the mm. band getting infections seven times in 18 months. But how stigmatized must condoms have been because they have this experience and they clearly aren't using them? Mm. Yeah, look, there. There was some suggestion somewhere in the film that if you bring out a condom, the girl might think you think she's unclean. Mm. I have heard people saying that. I also have heard that as a cover for the, oh, use a condom and you kind of feel nothing thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Condoms have always been... Because the other problem with it is that, especially when you're not used to it, it breaks the flow. You hit the level of passion. It's, it's the same thing that was... Oh, one it of... takes two seconds to put one on. No, I know, no, no, and no, no, And you can no, make no, it I'm part not, of the routine if you've got your... I want to point out... I'm pointing out that it's wrong. I'm not saying... I'm not mm. saying... The vibe on why condoms are is this belief that it breaks the flow. I'm not saying it does. I'm saying that it... And I'm going to be honest... The most condom positive television is always gay. It's the best. Yeah, though it did bug me on Queer as Folk where they kept opening them with, with their, their teeth. teeth. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know why it's actually a bad thing. I just know not to do it. Because you well, can nick it, basically. Yeah, uh -huh. you can, yeah, put a hole in it. But, yeah, I mean... And depending on what kind of condom, you could end up getting loop the loop in your mouth, in your mouth and yeah. just tastes terrible. Yeah. Unless it's one that tastes like cherries. But, yeah, this was one of the things... It's never not been a thing. I mean, up until there's a... I think I might have mentioned it on this, this cast. Doco Kanamala, which is really amazing. Mm. And one of the big things which was a problem for it was that it actually spoke to a couple of girls. A couple of the people that were being interviewed are two girls who are underage and they're talking very candidly about sex. And they were talking about how they could never convince the guys to wear a condom. That, wow. that's just you know, And this is the late 90s, I think, early 2000s, when Kanamala was made. To this day, it's one of those things... It's still hard to convince blokes now. Yeah. I've had... Yeah, and that's what I'm... Yeah, and it's... And I know people who, yeah, they're otherwise level-headed and you're getting to a conversation about how condoms are a good thing and sort of you shouldn't buy into that, you can't feel nothing shit, and they go, no, well... Yeah, and yeah. it's total nonsense. And yeah, there's the belief that it'll it breaks the I've... flow and it stops it from being sexy. Which and is... I haven't been asked if I'm on the pill for these people who are still wondering ah, if So I remember my brain missed the groove and it was like, I haven't been asked if I'm on the pill as if you're accusing us because we haven't asked you <laughs> because it's something we should have done, which of course makes no sense. I just slipped a groove. <laughs> because my brain interpreters, no one's asked me if I'd like a yeah, drink. Well, yeah, what the hell, man? <laughs> all this time and you just don't care about whether I'm on the pill or not. <laughs> Bastards. So yeah, they're, it's still stigmatised and they're all the different sizes and they're all the different colours and they're fun and they're convincing guys to put on a condom just seems to be this never-ending battle. Yeah, and I admit, even though I know completely why it says this brand, I think it's Zero, that plugs itself as Australia's thinnest condom, the sex educator in me goes... That's not good. Yeah, that's that's not a claim to fame. Yeah, I know uh, why they're yeah, saying it. Too, yes. Because you can't yeah. feel nothing crowd, but... Yeah, Australia's it's... tiniest condom. No, wait, hang on. <laughs> but yeah, and there's also, yeah, oh, it'll break the flow and take the romance out of the moment and all that. Which, which, of course, is also the argument often used about clarifying consent and more than once during uh, the day. Oh, no, 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 but if we stop and talk about it, it'll... Just... No, I've been seeing wear a condom someone for consent. five years who always checks in. Yes. Wear a condom, seek consent. It's not fucking rocket science. Yeah, you get the impression from this <sighs> movie that condoms were sort of on a lull of well, popularity. Very of much so. They yeah. talked again and again about the pill. Well, I think, yeah, the pill did unleash a sort of the, we don't need well, to wear a condom because yeah, no one's going to get pregnant. That's right. Mm. And even with the surrounding issues of the STIs, this film talks about how most of them can be treated and go away, especially the commonest ones. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it does seem kind of ludicrous to us now living in a post-HIV pandemic world. Of course. Yeah, mm. so they just figured, oh, I, I could just get it treated. 
Exactly. Mm. I mean, I didn't even know if fluid bonding was a thing in 1975. Well, blood brother stuff's been... Well, no, that's not... Is that fluid not fluid bonding? bonding? Fluid bonding is where basically Alice gets all her checks and makes sure she's got none of the things she can pass on. Bob also gets all these checks and makes sure she's got none of the things they can pass on. Alice presumably is on the pill in this scenario, or maybe to try and make babies, I don't know. But they will have sex with no barrier protection, knowing there's no diseases, or in oh, theory, right. knowing there's that. no diseases mm. to go back and forth between them, as long as neither of them has sex with anyone else, which could yeah. bring ah. something into the yeah, bubble. So I'm yeah, in that at the that. moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've done that. That's really awesome. Mm. Shit. Yeah, but whether it was a thing back then... Yeah, I think back then they just thought of it in terms of exclusivity or not cheating or still in the just get it cleared up later mm. yeah right when we get to the sex worker sequence yeah she mentioned Ava she... wrote down sex worker Dara you'd be very proud of me <laughs> yeah she mentions that she gets tested twice a week how did you get these interviews yeah they're incredible how do you even start exactly do it's you... like you look like a band that's got heaps of infections in the past exactly. let's chat on camera yeah, did someone know someone and who knew someone how did he get Grant Page well, but this is what's really weird not the Grant Page bit well, I know how he got Grant Page at all. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. And I would imagine... I mean, who knows? Maybe that was the seed of... Maybe we should talk about this. Maybe Brian Trenchard-Smith just, just suddenly noticed... with all these people and had discussions yeah. around the dinner table and said, I'm going to make a film. I mean, that's what led off the original Mad Max. So Mad Max was created by an ER surgeon... Yeah. ...who was sick and tired of peeling kids out of the clothes that were left over in car crashes. Maybe Brian Trenchard-Smith is like, oh, what do you mean you've gotten a dose of the clap? Our fucking production's three days to go sort of thing. <laughs> and maybe he suddenly stopped and said, well, hang on, Gareth's got it, and Roger thought he got it at one point, and Billy, who was going to be doing... Yeah, maybe he just simply went, look, guys, should we maybe... Let us know on Twitter, we're dying to know. <laughs> yeah, how did you... Hmm. What we're learning at the moment... Oh, God, what we're learning at the moment. What we should have been learning for ages and what we're saying. The more information that's out there, the better informed people are. And, yeah. Billy Thorpe tells a story. The Aztecs sort of nod along in the background. There's a lot of fun. Love the mullets. He... And they play a cool song. They play a cool song. Fuck Your Mind. Fuck Your Mind, which I couldn't actually find on Spotify, so it looks to have been a live one that was released. There is a reference to... Apparently it's also known as Blow Your Mind. I was wondering about that. That might make sense. It probably is in there then. But, uh, yeah, this is the Sunbury edition, I think, or something. that was live at a particular festival. and then Sunbury Festival? So we'll go Sunbury Festival, yes. Uh, frightening place. And also because of the attitude of the doctor. He tended to treat me more as uh, just another case of VD that he was treating rather than as a person who was coming to him as a client, um, there being some sort of contract between us for services. Uh, it was also somewhat unpleasant because of the fact that when he began the interview, the first thing he asked me was whether the sexual partner was a male, which at the time I found very frightening because it was the first time I'd ever been to a clinic and also because I hadn't come out at the time as being gay. And so I answered, well, no, it wasn't, which in fact it wasn't, although I had been getting off with men at the time. And they went through the usual procedure of doing the examinations and things like this. And in fact, I found out then that I didn't have VD. It was only later that I caught VD. Should we talk about the gays? Please. Say so the quote, Venereal disease is a particularly unwelcome complication for homosexuals. Psychologically speaking, homosexuals have a tough enough time just being gay. Wow. Woke mm. as fuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, again, this is one of those areas where you're talking about people from an industry which is classically has a significant portion of people who are known filmmaking. as... Yeah, filmmaking in general. For 1975, given what, the first... What was the first Mardi Gras March? 1978. 78. As it's pointed out in the interview, it is still a crime. They are incredibly accepting about the concept. They, there's nothing in this... Well, sorry, let me rephrase. As I says right now, I saw nothing in this that seemed to be overtly anti-gay. No, no. I mean, there's some outdated this and sort of attitudes well, overall, yeah, but not saying, not too gayness per se. More sorry, the, in, saying F A G G O T. Yeah, and the two guys, syphilis, uh, syphilis and, and gonorrhea, talking in the factory. Sorry, yes, yeah. that is yeah. Oh, so I thought you meant specifically the bit with the gay dude. I did love the rather beautiful gay young man complaining that he didn't like going to the clinics. They were very drab. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude, that's just what clinics look like. Yeah. And then being told he had the gentleman's disease. Yes. That was a weird phrasing. Yeah, very unusual. Oh, um, gentleman's used to be an all-purpose euphemism for anything to do with the genitals, too. Yes. Oh, OK, right. OK. I was once told a friend of mine had gone to hospital because he in injured his gentleman's area. Oh, yes. When he'd had testicular torsion. 
Ooh. I think the doctor actually says the gentleman's area at some point too. But uh, yeah, he had extremely valid concerns. Being gay yeah. was still criminal, and if you're going to a clinic saying you've caught this, you're going on record mm-hmm. as saying you've committed this crime that's got maximum 14 years jail. Yeah. Still a parallel today with drugs is, you know, why people still die of overdoses, is they're just too shit scared to go to a mm-hmm. hospital and get treatment. Yeah, but and the when... hospitals don't have mandatory reporting for drugs, do they? I don't know, and that's part of the problem. Yeah. More importantly, if you're that kind of scared, then any we're not going to tell anyone, we'll just fall false anyway. Yeah, you're not going yeah. to believe it as it is. And especially if you you get caught in a situation if you're found by a police officer they bring you in or whatever so yeah this whole going on the record when you make something a crime I mean yeah what's the line when you make something innocent a crime you make innocent people criminals or something like mm-hmm. that and it's yeah does Australia have that thing that well I assume it's true in the US if you go to the hospital with a gunshot wound it's got to be reported do we have that or is it even a thing in, know, in, in America, but it, or is it just a TV trope? I don't know, actually. I honestly really do cool. not know. I mean, I know I've been told by friends in the health industry how sacrosanct doctor-patient confidentiality is, but I don't know where the... the line. Yeah, because almost all kind of confidentiality things I know have some point where you can go, OK, things are going to get worse if we don't tell anyone than if we do. Like mm. mandatory reporting of child sex offences. Yeah, there mm. we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even simple things like, you know, if you can't drive away from the scene of an accident, it has to be reported. That's something that's really commonly believed. And for all I know, maybe true, but I don't know. And that's the thing. It's the big question. And if you're... Well, I've only ever had one car accident, but it was a pretty major one, so yeah. that was reported. <laughs> well, we had to call them. But yeah, it's a, if you're marginalised already, and as you say, up to 14 years is hanging over mm. your head, then yeah, that's got to be careful. And then the voiceover says, fortunately, most gay people don't Share believe to the views. show or, or don't fear it to that level. Mm. And then cuts back to the clinic, and the clinicians are all like, yeah, we know, or they don't say, but the voiceover then says, you know, clinicians maintain this confidentiality because yeah. otherwise they can't treat it. And their end game is to treat this because that way it'll get out of the community and you want the best possibility for treating it and preventing it from going any further. So gay people were already scared mm. of going to clinics before the AIDS crisis happened. This film at least could, for some people, maybe put it out there and go, some people might go, okay, maybe it is true if they put it in this thing that's all about the whole subject. Yeah, yeah. which, yeah, but could... I'm curious how they communicated <laughs> test results. If it was a phone call or a letter to your house, I and mean, was there someone else in your house, a spouse or whatever, saying, oh, what was that phone call? What do you say? Or what I was that letter? I would imagine your first point is come back in a week and we'll have your results. Ah, uh, right. Mm. Would yeah. probably be what I would say. Yeah, you're probably right. It's funny, we have this psychological thing in this day and age that we're externally contactable. Yes. When in actual fact, for a long period pre-mobile phone, you know, if you went somewhere and then walked away, you were basically gone. You needed to initiate that point of contact again, mm. I suppose. So, yeah. Mm. And also that meant if you're coming back for your results and they needed to, like, prescribe something, they could do it right there and then. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Mm. Which, of course, is one of the things that they talk about when they've got the drug testing centres and stuff is that they are in a position to immediately not only test the drugs but also inform the person at the other end and who knows maybe explain some dangers above and beyond what it is they brought in that might then you know it's a point Which of contact exactly what they do when they're allowed but they're not often because drugs are bad okay listen son i have a medical checkup twice a week right i've got more reason to be careful than most right i shower after every trick and in addition i got this what is it Well, I don't play it in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. I'm a pro, son, and that means professional in my book. I don't believe in taking risks. And then we move on to the hard-nosed sex worker. Such a cliche. He is like the most bogan character in all of this. So unsexy. And I don't know if it's a trope because it's common or if it's just a cliche trope. The gum-chewing... Lassay fair, I don't care, come here, get your end I kind of thought it was classist. I, yeah, it's, no, because the thing is, I suppose, the point about sex workers, in the same way as anybody dealing in a hospitality industry, you know, one that's massively stigmatised or not, is you're there to deliver a particular thing for a client. Some clients may be specifically seeking that kind of a, some clients may be, some clients may be... (laughs) 
So we've got oh. a kitten in between trying to crawl in the equipment <laughs> and then crawl in the presenters. And... What the hell? <laughs> now I All think right. she's about to jump into She doesn't nothing. like he's going to try to jump. So sex... Oh, Why me. isn't the sex worker using condoms anyway? Again, this might be one of those things where the clients would mostly say no. But sex workers are there to deliver. And while... Oh, what's that disgusting line? She's got a vested interest in keeping her plumbing in working order or something. If you were to be paying for a sexual encounter... You're surely wanting... Oh, God, how do I say this nicely? Better bedside manner? More than a whole? Yeah. Oh, not... sorry. I was spelling off a W and it made no sense. Yeah, no, 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 no that's right. Yeah, <laughs> She's yeah, there yeah. now. Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, I was thinking in terms of the whole service, including oh, her being right. a Oh, right, no, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, you're expecting an experience. Now, like I said, for some people, I guess, if you're doing that, you know, walk on the wild side, maybe that's what you want. Maybe that's what... No kink shaming. I mean, kink, really. Just no sex shaming. But it's such a trope. It's such a cliche trope. And I don't get how you could be aroused in that if that's not specifically what you're after. If you want a sexual encounter with someone, surely you would need more than... I was mostly shocked that she and... didn't have matching bra and knickers. <laughs> she might have got them from Vinny's or somewhere, but clearly she didn't care about them because she left them on so he could rip them off if she wanted to. Yes! So yeah, I don't know. I just it seems like a lazy trope to me. And what you hear again and again from interviews with sex workers is they're bloody fifty percent sexual satisfaction delivery systems and fifty percent or sometimes even more bloody carers and listeners and mm. yeah, bloody... there's the thing. She's just got poor customer service in yeah. yes. the most general term. And really, when she's all, I got to make sure you're clean. Yeah. And he says something like, well, how do I know you're clean? I just am, okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's got your back up enough. You're gonna, you are kind of want to go, no, hang on. Mm. Yeah. Unless, because at the very end when he says he's not in the mood anymore, he leaves and she says, leave the money on the counter. Maybe her whole thing is just... Just washing desexual- clocks. Well, <laughs> just totally desexualizing people to the point where they don't even want to do it. <laughs> and then she still gets the money anyway. I will say that good old dead hole. It's such... I don't know if it's an Australian thing or not, as in I think it's unique to Australia, but it is such an Australian thing, that particular shaped bottle with the, the green and white. Like, the smell, the scent of that eucalyptus disinfectant and the way it goes cloudy when you put yeah. it in water. Yeah. God, it was evocative. Jesus. And that's the other thing, too, is he's continually asking questions and she never educates him. No, and she comes across as she's knowledgeable. Yeah. She could just... Yeah, yeah, bad customer service. Yeah, <laughs> most, not all of his questions aren't unreasonable under no, the circumstances. No, that's right. And I'm sorry, if your radar is so bad that you don't recognise it is his first time, then, yeah, that's, again, just... Yeah. It's unnecessary contempt. There's no reason. This whole sequence was poorly written. But I did like the line where he asks what a vaginal douche is, and she says, well, I don't play it in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> that did get a genuine chuckle. But, yeah, so she talks about just sort of cleaning and, yeah, keeping herself in working order, as it were. Hmm. Mm. And then we go to Bettina fucking aunt. Bettina that was a aunt. surprise. Yeah. Holy mm. crap. There's a career arc. <laughs> yeah. We shouldn't really become an MRA until a few decades later. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of her sort of history through that period is being very, you know, progressive. Progressive, but, you know, she had how best to describe it. Progressive is probably not the best word. She was a forefront of, of she feminist ideals. She has a weird line. And, Mm. So she says it was really introduced or, as a means of scaring people off having premarital intercourse. What was? Is she a sexual conspiracy theorist? I don't know. Wow. I, I don't know what that, that means. Mm. I got that she cast a lot of aspersions on the education process in general. So well, she yeah, and later she says like a... we need to reduce the stigma around condom use and VD. Yeah, 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 absolutely. She's, mm. she's incredibly progressive back then. So she seemed to be trying to do the right thing. But I never got the yeah, that idea. I wonder what she says was introduced as a way to... I just get don't know. Because it wouldn't surprise me that especially a conservative group... you mean group, the stigma? Maybe the stigma, yeah. The stigma was introduced as a means to scare people off premarital intercourse. That's really weird. Yeah, I didn't clock that phrase in that context. Yeah, huh. it's very weird. Did it seem like she was largely trying to educate the female community? Because they spoke about her as if she was... I don't know, and I also don't know how if you put pretty flowers on condoms, that makes the teenagers like them more. I thought she was saying that was already a thing that had happened. Yeah. I thought she was saying they tried that, because certainly by the late 70s, early 80s, and I don't know whether or not this is early enough for, or late enough for that, they were already starting to become patterned, scented, flavoured. Mm. You could buy... I think if you had messages on them, they were like, make love, not war, and things would be printed mm. on labels and stuff. The big education campaign that kicked off just after the AIDS epidemic struck 
I thought built on that. I didn't think it was all brand new, but again, I might be totally wrong. And the other thing too is, you know, we talked about earlier, you know, the idea that you wouldn't be able to feel anything. Back then, maybe they were thick enough that there was not too much sensation. We see one of their condoms though, and it doesn't look significantly thicker or different no. from a contemporary one. No, well, a contemporary to us one, I should looks, say. It looks thicker than ones you can get now. The thinnest condom in Australia is an example. But yeah, you're right. It wasn't overly hardcore, but it was still. I was going to say, yeah, it seemed looser. I don't know. It's really weird, yeah. And, yeah, we get the demonstration, which was interesting because that was such a big thing, I can remember, all through the 80s. The education, the demonstration about the use of condoms. I think they even joke about it, even in something as recent as Parks and Rec. There's an episode where she rolls a condom onto a banana or something at some point. There's always a banana. Well, this is the thing. So, so again, we have another one of these... Not an eggplant. We have another one of these anecdotes... Which I've always heard slightly differently, which is that Mm -hmm. he says that, you know, when somebody was introducing condoms to a village, he demonstrated by putting them over the top of walking canes. And then when he went back the following day, outside every house, there There was was a a stick with a condom on it. So Um, we have the doctor demonstrating the use of a condom, but he just rolls it onto his fingers. But then mm. he is very specific to say... Now, of course, you do understand that this has to go on the penis, not on my fingers, I showed you. And then it tells us the, I think, yeah. the uh, India anecdotes. Yeah, yeah. but I've heard it a few places, a few demographics, a few things that aren't penises that the condom was put on to. So, I mean, I guess by law of numbers, something like that happened somewhere, but yes, I think it's I something that became a some... nice funny story as to why you, you'll make it so clear you have to put it on the penis so people will yes. go, oh, that's why they're saying that, even though it's obvious to me. Yeah, yes. the, the disc drive coffee holder story, which apparently was nonsense. Yeah, the one I'd always heard was the banana, and that he's actually, I believe it was a South Mason Dixon line section of America, and he got two very uneducated yokels who are shown how to avoid pregnancy because they've got too many kids and I mean that's the thing is so much sort of leads into it they're poor they've got too many kids already and so the doctor shows them how to stop sex and demonstrates a condom on a banana and then it turns out that what they've done is they put a condom on a banana and left it on the bedside table before they have sex so it's (sighs) got this aura of classism or racism or something is depending who the other group is Yeah. yeah but when you think about it objectively that must mean whoever was demonstrating the condom and put it on the walking stick or the banana or the carrot or whatever at no point said it's supposed to go on the penis. Yes, <laughs> yes, which I'll give Doc points for that because he does make it very clear. He then goes into the anecdote. But then, yeah, then we're on the down slope, I think, after that. And now we have Clyde Packer. Clyde Packer. This dude is pissed off at the power of the Catholic Church because they're anti-sex, anti-condom stance. If only he had some kind of platform. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the thing, so so this is going to sound really bizarre. I'm going to be honest, it was a part I wanted to research, and I ended up doing such deep dives on other things, I never got around to it. Who is he in the Packer dynasty? It's Frank Packer's son. Right, yeah. And it's Clyde, isn't it? I wrote Clyde, Clyde. up there. Yeah. Clyde. Brother of Kerry. Right. He's, he's Kerry Packer's brother. Right, yeah. okay, yeah. Cause, and so what was he doing in this? I don't know. Up until now... Every other person involved, you can kind of see where they're coming from. Even Bettina Art. I mean, she's trying to, you know, educate in sex and so on. Mm. You've got the anecdotes of people who've got the disease. You know, you're asking the youth because yeah, you Yeah, but why did we have news. Clyde? Yeah, he was a member of the Legislative Council. So he was someone in government. What was he doing at the time? So he was in a dispute with his dad about nine... After Clyde Packer's resignation from the family's media interest in 1972, three years ago, Mm -hmm. he became involved in the counterculture. Right. In the next year, Packer established an adult sex magazine with Bettina Arndt. Ah! There we go. So they got two for the price of one. In March... Bettina Arndt was in a... established a... Wow. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Yes, so... As you say, pretty much if they knew they were getting Bettina Arndt, they could have easily got Clyde or vice versa. Yeah, probably knocked yeah. on the next door down the corridor. Yeah, yeah. probably. And, um. yeah, kind of shows they were in that mm. area and he was in that area. So I think once you kind of detach him from being related to Kerry Packery, it makes sense. Mm. And I do have to say okay. a positive thing about Bettina. I really liked her dress. Mm. She edited a forum between 1974 and 1982, which was an Australian adult sex education magazine. She had a lot of appearances and things. <laughs> So the party is now partially naked. Yeah, well, 1% naked. Well, we had the woman that was stripping at the start, but yeah, yeah, now a bloke just runs in. 
Yeah, yeah. So we're back yep. to the party. Naked, naked, naked Dave. Naked yeah. Dave. Yeah. Hey, he hey, just Dave. He's got naked again. He just gave his hug to his <laughs> male friend, and that's totally cool. It's yeah. like the naturist couple on Family Guy. Oh, God, I haven't seen, haven't seen it. Oh, one of their seen. sets of neighbours, naturists, nudists, but they are everywhere, so not just in their home. Like uh, they're down the shops. Yeah, so when you run into these guest characters at a Kiss concert, pick from one episode. <laughs> and the final line in this film is, Ignorance and fear are the only reasons VD has reached epidemic proportions. And you can take out VD and insert so much Well, else. I would have put it down to all the people boning. <laughs> I look. I think the movie has established that you can bone safely. Eventually, it took yeah. us a long yeah. time to get to condoms. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it took so long to get to condoms. I was almost like, am I am I just wrong? And condoms didn't exist at this point in time. Yeah, no, yeah. Hang on. no, no, condoms are in the very first sequence where the two workers are in the factory. Yeah, and, that's and then they oh, never yeah, 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 spoken that's right. of again. Yeah, <laughs> so you start. To but want... then they were spoken of like they're a historical artifact. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You start yeah. to wonder, did I get it wrong? Is a yeah. condom spring into existence two years ago or whatever? Yeah. It's like a five-minute universe thing. Condom invention, 1994. It's funny I say 94 because I remember when I went to university, I got given a show bag by the student union that included dental dams and condoms and cool. lubricant. Yeah, yeah. it's really awesome. Mm. I've got one of them at all. Mm. They're really cool. So Ken Doyle and Luda, it's spelled A-P-I-N-Y-S, and I don't know if it's pronounced a penis. It's probably not. How's it spelled? A P I N Y S. A penis. A penis. A penis. A penis. Yeah. So hopefully it's not an mm. aptronym. Aptronym. Is that a word sound that makes sense in the context? It's a made up word. Well, I mean, all words made up, duh. But <laughs> money's fake. And money is fake. No, if you're like, surname happens to be Baker and you become a baker. Oh, right. Like cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's it's, that thing. it's the name part of nominative determinism. Ah. Nominative determinism. That's the Love word it. I wanted to look up. That's kind of funny. So, yeah, because the casting basically boils down to self or several, pretty much every actor, no with the exception of a few, is basically just, yeah, self or several. It's really hard for us who don't necessarily know who every yeah. actor is to pin down who so is So Callum feels who. it's the couple that shag at the start of the movie? I don't know. Well, I was trying to work out why they would feel they were in porn. Because of the sex? <laughs> no, no, no. But the, yeah. So, I mean, you mean, so they, could, they could appear anywhere. Hmm. Also, part of me is thinking those were the two with the highest stake of coming off badly in this movie or being embarrassed by this movie. The couple at the start who shag and yeah. yeah. Well, unless it's one of the dudes that's got discharge coming out of his cock. They mm. seem pretty happy with that. Maybe. Mm, mind you, so did the sex couple at the start. Yeah. I'm also thinking they're the only ones that come as a pair. Well, that's right, but we don't know. Well, that's what she says anyway. <laughs> Oh dear. Go and write an Alvin movie. <laughs> <laughs> Look, they may just be two totally different people, like yeah. in two totally different scenes. It might have been one of the teenagers mm. and uh, and maybe the woman who opened up about her story. Hell, it could have then... been the nurse at the clinic. Mm. Yeah. Any of them. I tried looking them up on IMDb and she has Nothing. only been in one other thing and he's been in no other thing. Yeah, oh. yeah, that's yeah. right. So, look, and again... Did they have the best intentions? I felt like there were positive intentions in this. I do feel like Yeah, they... I would say they had the best intentions, but they had good ones. They had good ones. And I mean, at the end of the day, as we've discussed again and again on Ozploitation, it's about making money, making it for X and selling it for X plus Y. So did but... we say it was 5.4 stars on IMDb, which is very respectable? Yeah, for what it is. And the budget was only $33,000. Box office was 367 Yeah. And it's really weird because when Brian Trenchard-Smith has been interviewed and sort of really plays this one down, he says, oh, it made a bit of money. Made a bit I of think. a profit. Yeah, yeah, made a bit of a profit. Which it seems um, she really does not like to talk about this film. No, possibly made one of the best profit ratios of any of his movies. We don't yeah. know what the blow up cost because it was thousand percent. Is it? I can filmed, never work out percentages. Filmed on uh, sixteen mil and blown up to yeah, which means it would have looked seedy on the big screen. Even for the time, the quality would have been probably noticeably seedier. I, I mean, we, we've seen are... a couple of examples where it hasn't worked out so well. I guess it also depends who did it and how. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And I guess also I'm curious about where this one was sent, what sort of cinemas it would be targeting, because... Well, that's a good question. Have... And was it sent internationally? Mm. I don't know. Mm. I couldn't, At mm. some point it was, because Turner Classic Movies had it. Wow. Oh, my God, did they? Mm. Wow. 
Yeah, it's surprisingly not... Oh, surprising. It's not that easy to find. It has been released as an extra... It's on a movie that's not right, Brian okay. Trenchard-Smith. No, right. Okay, or yeah. sex, it's, or documentary. Yeah, it's called High Rolling. High Rolling. Yeah, totally separate release just in there. Yeah, and that's the one we watched. As far as I know, this is the best version circulating. Mm. I don't know if anyone's ever looked at cleaning it up further. Apparently there's a cut for TV versions bouncing around the internet. Yeah, that I, makes sense. I don't know. I haven't found or seen it. I just know this one from the High Rolling mm. desk. Is High Rolling on the yeah. on the radar? Cool. Because I'd yeah. be curious to see just how sexual that film is. Because with the best will in the world, unless High Rolling is a pretty blatant sexual film, to have an extra which includes close-ups of infected penises it's... and vaginas is going to be a bit... It is a hexagon, yes. Okay, so it's... that makes sense at least. Yeah. yeah. It's Roadshow and it's Hexagon. So, yeah, and as we saw, they've got at least some sequences from a Grant Page film, too. And it was um, You Know Who who released it. Um, Umbrella. Of course. <laughs> as they should. And we love them for it. Sponsor us. Give us money. Yay. Or, or at least DVDs. DVDs. Yeah, at least DVDs. That's exactly what I was going to say. Of just course it is. Or at least DVDs. copies of your Chances prints. Chances. Yes. Give us Chances. Please. What makes us think Umbrella has those? Well, they've released their mini... Mini Chances. The mini Chances. They're kind of the refined episodes. So maybe they only paid for those. Maybe we should actually phone them and ask if they have them instead of just hoping no, they'll listen no, to the I want end to con- of our random podcast. I want to continue dropping podcast pies into the void until they pick one up. <laughs> <laughs> they do know we exist. We are on their radar. Right they have plugged them. us. Yes. Not for plug. Not for plug. <laughs> no, they, they gave us a nice little write-up for the year before last Valentine's, in fact. Yeah. Uh, for the double feature. Yeah. Yes, which was... Uh, that was a special episode. A very special episode. Which apparently you can tell Daria is the only one sober by the end of yes. it. Yes. But all artists hate their early work, is a cliché. I can totally see why somebody like Brian Trenchard-Smith and Tim Bursell as well would feel that, you know, this is a blot. But at the same time, you've got to start somewhere, as we talked last episode. Buddy George Clooney started on Attack of the Killer Tomatoes too, And And this isn't a blot. I don't think 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 it's great. Yeah, at worst, this is outdated. Yeah, and it was always going to be. Yeah, you can't fight that. It's the encyclopedia you put on the shelf. You've got to put it on the shelf at some point. You can't continue Mm -hmm. to write it. Well, you can now. Yeah, it's trying to... Destigmatize STIs and yeah. BDs, as, as they're calling it at this era. Obviously, it's certainly not their fault they included nothing about the AIDS pandemic because it hasn't it happened, happened yet. He gave us popular characters to share their oh. stories, Billy Thorpe, as Aztecs, Grant Page and mm. Roger Ward. And they handled the homosexuality in almost exactly the perfect way, which is to literally just treat it like it's a thing. Yeah, I loved mm. it. Again, it's not been commissioned. Gay women it's don't exist, but that's sort- historically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> or they are referenced once. Were mm. they? I thought it was straight women giving head. Why? Well, he just says women. He just said right. women, women yeah, engaged but- in fellatio during the yeah, so homosexual not gay sequence. Women. No, oh, okay, all right. Yeah, it was during the sequence discussing homosexual sex. Yeah, they're, so yeah. but they're probably, not, as... they're probably not forward-thinking enough to think that is a woman going down another woman's dick. No. No. Yeah, we have dated, a bit hacked. Weirdly, considering some of the movies we've watched previously with tonal shifts of fucking fifth to reverse with no clutch use like we had with Melvin. Well, at least if you're doing a sketch slash vignette format, yeah, it's great, then you're supposed it? to do that. That's right. And look, that sort of shit is always in educational films. You watch any film about office relationships or you know dealing with safety, they've recognised that you will pay attention to something if it's a little funny, if it little sticks in your head. There's a movie... And how a... we compare bits of this to Python. Yeah, yeah. So I that's mean, a you know, massive a, win. Yeah, you know, quality definitely of a, of a slightly lower level level but certainly reminiscent of and it's also a great peek into how this topic was being handled circa 1975 yeah i don't uh, think most really people would have handled it this progressively no yeah well with reference to homosexuality i mean yeah i was thinking overall society because it tells about how society is handling it yeah in mm. the movie so society as a whole would be less progressive than this movie but this yeah. movie uses progressive to show that society is a bit backwards on it and, you and know, so this movie made a pretty good profit and you know it's aimed at men i'd like to think that men came out of this being a bit less homophobic well do you know the thing that's literally just struck me the second i don't think there's one reference in the entire film to abstinence True. I don't think for even once do they try no. to say just don't. The closest you get is Billy Thorpe saying that his doctor told him that if he didn't start 
being careful mm. or, you know, dialing it back. Problems. He was going to have problems later yeah. on. But I don't think a single moral lesson from this is mm. just don't have sex, you naughty, filthy, dirty people. Yeah, and in fact it mentioned the amount of people 15 to Yeah, it mentioned 20. 15 and then even said... that. About 16-year-olds faking their details. Would be under-reporting, so probably yeah. it's even more than that. Mm. Yeah, and that used to be a thing. You'd just kind of politely pretend... It still is. Yeah. Teenagers never have sex. The reality of the fact is that puberty strikes and sexual Hormones curiosity take over. takes over, and that can happen as young as 12. Yeah, no, um, they weren't launching Bump in 1975. Bump? Well, that new show on Stan... Which is about a teenager as a surprise baby. Oh. Oh, right. A surprise baby. Yeah. That happens. Oh, no, okay. Yeah, no, unexpected. Sorry. Gee, how did I get a baby? What do I need to have to... Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Oh, no, there are so many stories about women who don't know they're pregnant until they're giving birth. It's so disturbing. Oh, my God. Until they're giving birth. Gee. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, it's one of Facebook's favourite short videos to show me at the moment. Anyway, that's... So that's where kittens come from. Yeah. So happy... (laughs) Happy, Happy Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day! Get VD. Don't get VD. Go and, and if love you do, safely. Go to the clinic. Go to the but clinic. But also use condoms so you don't have to go to the clinic. Use mm. condoms. They're fucking awesome. They come in a range of colours and some glow in the dark. And you can get some spermicides and some lubes that spermicides and yeah. all and sorts of things. Yeah, it can be incorporated and... into the fun stuff, not bloody set aside as a problem. I mean, it involves your dick. How bad can it be? Exactly right. Mm. Oh, I don't know if you've seen somebody, <laughs> some people's dicks. <laughs> yeah, after watching um, that movie. But, yeah, so I don't know why. There might be a completely legitimate reason we've not thought about why BTS doesn't feel like people need to see this film. Maybe it's just because it is just so out of date. Maybe he doesn't feel it's got any value these days. But I really think it sort of does. So... Yeah, I could see why he's not overly proud of it because he's done. He's done some. He's done bigger and better things. Oh God, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I don't think he needs to tell us not to watch it. No, didn't work anyway. I think about the only reason, maybe, like I said, is it doesn't seem to have been a film that was sought out by health or anything. There's no government support. There wasn't a you know as funded by the whatever. It was quite clearly a private decision made by private individuals Mm. that they wanted to make a film about this. But that's no bad thing in itself because it means people are thinking about and working on it. And even if they want to make it for the kind of cynical reason of, hey, this is a great way to sneak some tits and arse on screen. And again, like I've said before, I don't think anyone's going to see this film to try and get sexually titillated because there'll be whole sequences. Oh, Oh, no. You know. The end result. When I was researching, I found other, quote, sex education, unquote, films that really were just dressed up porn delivery systems, mm. and they didn't have nearly the actual factual useful content this mm. did. Let's wind it up. It's steamy in here. Yep. Mm. All right. I'm giving this one four and a half umbrella sounds. It's awesome for what it is and when it was. And today, some attitudes, could people can take a leaf out of some attitudes in this book. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Oh, yeah. DVD. What speculums over here? Hmm? Am I giving it a yep? A yep. Yep. On the new November rating system that's for twenty twenty one. Give In it a fact, yep. It could even get a fuck yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. It's good work, Brian. Nice. <laughs> and Tim. And Michael. And everybody true. else. Yes, true. But keep listening until next time when we will be watching some one. sidecar races. <laughs> I've been Daria. I'm probably November. And I'm still Callum. Thank you. Thank Happy you. Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's. Happy Valentine's. Congratulations, you fearless folks. You made it to the end, and with nary a pulsating pustule or slimy scab in sight. With any luck. But, as we've just learned, a brush with the dreaded dose is far from the end of everything. For some, a brief bout of the social disease may well have been a mark of pride. But we here at Podsploitation heartily recommend you take a far more careful approach especially in this day and age of plague and pestilence. Remember, covering a cock with a condom before commencing a coupling could keep you completely clear of the clap. And that is far harder to say than it is to do. So nearly 50 years on, the hairstyles and clothes may well have changed, but the message is still the same. We can have just as much fun from rubbing our various bits together as ever, but just... Be a little clever, as you shouldn't have to worry about all those bits dropping off. So happy humping, you horny horde. Go forth and perform whichever mathematical functions you prefer. And let me leave you with this Valentine's Day ditty. Rashes are red, the movies are blue. From all of us here, remember, BD loves you.
Thank you for listening to Daria, Callum and November on Podsploitation, the Ozploitation podcast. Host announcer, Empress Eerie, www.empresserie.com. More episodes at anchor.fm forward slash podsploitation or via your podcaster of choice. Get in touch with us via Facebook or Twitter at podsploitation or via email to podsploitation at gmail.com. If you want to help support the show, you can donate any currency in any amount at paypal.me forward slash podsploitation. Theme music is Space Ocean Dream by Keely Kultz, used with their kind permission under the Creative Commons. Their work can be found and purchased at musicbros.de. All other clips are for review and commentary purposes only. They remain the copyright of their respective holders and no claim or infringement is intended. No dilating sounds were harmed in the making of this podcast. Podsploitation is a Moment of Mayhem production. Did St. Valentine die of syphilis?